Welcome, everybody. The Global Task Force of Local and Regional Governments, over 27 organizations working with local and regional governments around the world, convenes the World Assembly of Local and Regional Governments in a joint voice as a means to work together to raise awareness about the critical issues that we are facing in humanity and to bring a voice to the multilateral system and to the international community. The World Urban Forum and the Habitat uh, process are very dear to our hearts as World Assembly of Local Governments because they saw the very first session of the World Assembly in Habitat 2 and it has consolidated the World Assembly in Habitat 3. In fact, the outcome document of Quito recognizes the World Assembly of Local and Regional Governments as a monitoring mechanism. The World Assembly meets at least once a year. This year we will be convening two times because we have convened it for the first time already in April during the review of the new urban agenda. A very important milestone indeed. But we did not want to leave our seat empty here at the World Urban Forum and this is why we are gathering today again to look not only at the progress that we have made in the implementation of the new urban agenda, but also to look at the new context and the new challenges. I am very pleased to uh, invite uh, Her Excellency, the Executive Director of UN Habitat, our dear friend, once a mayor, always a mayor, Maimuna Mood Sharif. The floor is yours, Excellency. Like, thank you very much. Uh... Thank you very much, my friend, my sister, and partner in crime, <laughs> Emilia, and uh, Excellencies, and Honorable Ministers, Mayors, uh, Representative of local and regional government, colleagues and friends. As Emilia said, once you are a mayor, you always have a mayor at heart. So I feel that it's, I'm, I'm among all, all my friends within this uh, uh, room. A very good afternoon to you. Let me take this opportunity to welcome all of you to the 11th session of the World Urban Forum in Katowice. I know that it's a very short notice, but uh, you know what's happened uh, 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 within, the, uh, the, within our surroundings. And um, I'm very happy to see many of my colleagues, many of my friends. I was in Kisumu with the mayor, with the governor in the, during the every cities. So thank you so much for coming here. Happy to be uh, with the two friends of uh, dynamic local leaders, the Honorable uh, Mayor Barry, uh, Mayor of uh, Kitchener, and also UCLD Governing President, and also the Honorable Martin Krupa. I don't know where he is sitting. Maybe he's, he's in Arabia. I'm not. It's a very, very uh, a lot of things uh, are happening uh, today, and let me also extend my, my gratitude to first to Mayor Krupa and to the government of Poland for hosting the WUF 11 in these uh, challenging times. As always mentioned in terms of the, in the challenging time of the four C's, COVID-19, climate change, crisis, conflicts, and also capital. So I think this is very important that they're being gathered here today is uh, an important message of hope for everyone. And thank you so much for your commitment to make this forum happen. I also would like to extend my greeting to the Global Task Force for Local and Regional Government. I was part of the Global Task Force. I was part of the person who hold the play card outside the General Assembly. Hashtag listen to cities. I still remember that. And for your tireless work done uh, in convening this World Assembly and for mobilizing the local and regional government constituency for the important conversation that we are going to have uh, this week until 30th of uh, June. The World Assembly is the official mechanism for local and regional governments to review the implementation of the new urban agenda. It convenings presents us with an opportunity actually to assess challenges, discuss action, no, not only declaration, discuss action and shape common solutions from the bottom up. So, uh, colleagues, more than two years ago, have passed since Wolf 10 in Abu Dhabi. 
Then the border was closed due to COVID. Now we are back here when we launched the Abu Dhabi Declared Action, a compilation of 24 agreed action to contribute to the implementation of the new urban agenda and the SDG. Two years after, this commitment remained robust and indeed critical at the moment in an increasingly complex uh, global uh, context. Since our meeting in Abu Dhabi, the world has gone through multiple and multi-dimensional crises, extraordinary events that have revealed the weaknesses of our system and deepened the inequality in our society. One is the COVID-19 pandemic, in once in a generation's crisis that spiraled from the health emergency to a full-blown social economic crisis. Second is the continuation and expansion of conflicts, which has led to unimaginable displacement and suffering. The latest UNACR Global Trends report tells us that 100 million people have now been forced to flee their homes. The current conflict in Ukraine is sadly contributing to this trend in a very significant way. The third is the growing food shortages and food insecurity, including unprecedented rises in primary food prices impacting the already vulnerable groups, especially those in cities who don't grow their own food. And the increasing effect of climate crisis, the main threat to our existence today. Excellencies, honorable mayors and colleagues, we must act together urgently and with solidarity to implement the SDGs and use the transformative commitment of the new urban agenda to guide our collective action to save people and planet and advance peace and prosperity. This is the third time that I have the honor to convene the World Urban Forum as a UN Habitat Executive Director. This edition of WOLF will distinguish a before and after on the commitment of all stakeholders and spheres of government to scale up actions towards sustainable development. So more than 2,000, 20,000 registered participants. This is was late last evening, but I'm not sure about now from over 160 countries coming together and the World Urban Forum demonstrate exactly the kind of cooperation our world needs. So this forum actually builds upon the momentum of the high-level meeting of the UN General Assembly on the review on the, of the implementation of the new urban agenda held on the 28th of April this year. So as the President of General Assembly, His Excellency Mr. Abdullah Shahid noted, the high-level meeting was one of the most well-attended mandated meetings of the General Assembly in recent years. I think, Emilia, you agreed with me, this is the first time that the four mayors were given a stage at the at General Assembly ever. Congratulations. And over 90 member states participated in person, renewing commitments to advance sustainable local and urban development, including the strengthening of multi-level governance system and engagement with local government and other local actors. So the success of the high-level meeting, we just received the report yesterday, the report of all the high-level meeting from the office of PGA. This one has created opportunities. It's just very timely for us to discuss during this one week World Urban Forum. We must seize and this World Urban Forum is the best opportunity for us to do it together. I also would like to share with you, when I was in, in Kigali, we also put the call to action on sustainable urbanization. I'm very happy to, to share with you. I also received this note yesterday night saying that the head of the government in Commonwealth countries has accepted and, and, and endorsed uh, a resolution on the call to action on sustainable urbanization. Just very timely for us to discuss during the World Urban Forum. So with less than eight years to achieve the target set by the global goals, the time is short and, um, and unambitious and conventional thinking must be discarded. We must be maybe, I used to say, think out of box, 
but I, I also mentioned there's a, a things be beyond box, but I see things without without any box. So that you can because the sky is the limit. Yeah. So I, what I would like to say, uh, colleagues, that local action, your leadership, are very critical. I was a mayor before. That's why I think Emilia said this mayor is always a mayor. So I would like to call local action in leadership are critical to face the complexities of our time and to build sustainable, inclusive and resilient societies. So I also let me applaud to you all, fellowship representative of local and regional government constituency for being a continuous source of strength and inspiration. First, you all are a peace builders and human rights advocates. Cities are at the core of most wars, whether is it in, 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 in Mauripol, in, 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 in Ukraine, or Sana in Yemen, we are talking about cities and the effort of local government to keep their local communities safe. So local and regional government across the globe have unified their voices, pledging to stop bloodshed and destruction, and this solidarity and firm standing against violence must be fostered and remain as example of all enduring conflicts whether it is natural disaster or man-made. Second, all of you and all of us here are as driver of global commitments and agenda. Yes, they have the global agenda. Without the localization of SDG, without the mayors, without the governors, without the community, they become uh, uh, only at the global agenda. So in our complex time, local government are the key players to ensure the success of 2030 agenda and to secure a sustainable and prosperous future for our planet and people. Indeed, it is from the bottom up that the solution and innovation to tackle the current global challenges are created. But acknowledging the importance of local and regional government is not enough. Acknowledge is not enough. We have to work together, concrete action and support are needed at all levels. So for the past month, UN system and UN Habitat has been working tirelessly to advance this effort. First, the President of General Assembly created the Advisory Committee on Sustainable Urbanization. I think it's the first time that this bill has been created and the local government constituency is one of the members and Emilia is used to, to join us in the meeting. Second, my friends, we already launched the Local 20 Coalition was launched as a UN-wide initiative on localizing SDG, where UN Habitat, myself at the moment now, is the permanent chair of this Local 20 Coalition, together with the co-chair of UNDP every two years, then will be UNICEF and FAO. So this is Local 20 Coalition is our platform. So this is not easy to have this. I think that we can we work very closely with Global Task Force, with Amelia. It's not easy to, to, to formulate the Local 20 Coalition. This was launched in, in April uh, this, uh, this year. The third is in the UN Secretary General Report on Common Agenda. We, ha we are also the chair of the Future Cities, Task Force of Future Cities. And I'm very happy to say that the Common Agenda of Secretary General recognize the role of re local and regional government as a key actors to deliver on sustainable development. The establishment of advisory group on local and regional government to the second general is the outcome of this. This is not one day work. I know this is few years work and I think we are moving to that direction. So building on the renewed commitment of this year, including the outcomes of this World Assembly, 2023, this will be a de decisive in the review and advancement of the implementation of the new urban agenda and the SDG. So first, the high-level political forum will convene at the level of heads of state and government under the auspices of the General Assembly, meeting also known as SDG Summit. SDG 11 will be among the global goal to be reviewed at the high-level political forum in addition in September 2023. We still have time because next year will be SDG 11. The General Assembly will also host Summit of the Future. This event taken together will be a very critical moment 
to review and accelerate progress of all the 17 SDGs. Last but not least, 2023, my colleagues, is also the year of UN Habitat Assembly, UN Habitat General Assembly, where we will bring the voices and the priorities of local and regional government to our member state and at the centre of the renewed mandate of UN Habitat. I'm just to share with you during our recent bureau meeting at the executive board, I've been trying to put my idea, I, and I'm very happy to share with you, the chair of the executive board agreed to bring in two mayors. I asked for four, but okay, they give two, at least 50% done, two mayors to be part of our executive board in November this year. So I would like to get the, your, your support on that. So it is often said that during the worst time is when the best of us steps up. So this Wolf edition is timely to analyze the past, to understand what we can do differently and better together, and take concrete steps to transform our future of our city and of our generation. So thank you so much for all your leadership and the work. I wish all of you a fruitful week of discussion and come up with a very strong action plan and strong declared action from the local and regional government. Thank you so much. Over to you. Media. Well, thank you very much, and it's a good negotiation. You ask for something, you get 50%. We will not complain. We will back you up, Executive Director. Uh, thank you very much. Now, with the permission of the UCLG Governing President, allow me to give the floor to uh, the Mayor of The Hague uh, and, and Co-President of UCLG, Jan van Sanen, because you know how agendas are, and we want to accommodate all the voices. Uh, Mayor, the floor thank is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Emilia. Your Excellency, Maimuna, Dear friends, dear colleagues, dear mayors, ministers, governors, and partners, it is an honor to be here with you at the 11th edition of the World Urban Forum in Katowice, at this World Assembly of Local and Regional Governments. Allow me to thank our hosts from Poland and Katowice, as well as UN Habitat, for their courage and commitment to the development of sustainable urbanization by hosting the World Urban Forum and this World Assembly. In recent years, local and regional governments have worked to mitigate crisis, to deliver public services and foster peace in their territories. They have understood the value of public services to offer an alternative to traditional governance. Governance is based on care, care for those communities that need it. We cannot forget this at such a difficult time when in Europe and in the world we see examples of how force takes precedence and how we forget the feeling of togetherness that permeated during the first moments of the pandemic. In times of conflict, it is local to local exchanges driven by transformative city diplomacy that can build bridges in communities. We need to value the actions of local and regional governments as first respondents in crisis. Local and regional governments understand the importance of delivering basic services with care. The importance of understanding life beyond surviving and to curb equalities and navigate together towards a better future. And that is why we see the new urban agenda as an accelerator of our shared goals and as a transformative element for a, removed, for a renewed governance that rebuilds the trust of our communities, that puts people in the center, and that protects the right to the city to ensure that no one is left behind. The urban agenda recognizes the potential of local and regional governments to transform our systems. It is the agenda for overcoming social and territorial inequalities from the bottom up, and the framework under which to achieve an enabling environment for quality public services and to accelerate the achievement of all development agendas. And we showed this commitment to the urban agenda 
just two months ago in New York. Today, at this meeting of the World Assembly of Local and Regional Governments, we continue, we continue to call for the commitment of national governments to the implementation of the new urban agenda. It is time to remember that we want an effective implementation of the new urban agenda to achieve the world we want. For that, we need structural conversation between all actors. We need an international system that recognizes the potential of intermediary cities and regions and includes them in decision-making to achieve a renewed multilateral system. Moreover, we need a new understanding of the relation between national and subnational spheres of government to face growing inequalities. Also, we need broad local partnerships and adequately empowered local and regional governments in order to make multi-level governance truly effective. We need to go beyond talking about powers and capacities and towards a conversation that understands development as a joint effort. The role of local and regional governments as key innovative actors is essential in this context, perhaps more than ever. Local governments are critical to stimulate, to maintain, and to reactivate local economies, and to link and ensure that locally implemented measures are coherent with national and global policies. And therefore, therefore we need to be in dialogue with national and international actors to ensure any measures adopted are effective. And this requires multi-level and collaborative governance based on the principle of subsidiarity. And this is the way to ensure local and regional governments are not just providers or implementers of policies, but actors in their own right. And to be part of a system guarantees just, inclusive, and sustainable local, local development processes, leaving no one and no place behind. We know we have allies to make this happen, but we need everyone. We need everyone on board. In the face of the many challenges we face, in the face of a complex panorama in which the UN Secretary General proposes the opportunity to make our way, the new urban agenda is an agenda that speaks to us, the cities, the regions. It is the agenda of the planet, of prosperity, of peace, and partnerships. Excellencies, dear colleagues, dear friends, we are at a key moment to accelerate the implementation of the global agendas. And we need the commitment and actions of all actors. Support, support to local and regional governments is the cornerstone for jointly achieving the global agendas. Urbanization is one of the most important phenomena of this century, and that is why and that is why we urge national governments to move forward together to develop a strategy that incorporates all actors in decision making in order, in order to achieve the future that we all dream of. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor, for uh, this not only declaration of intent, but declaration of commitment uh, on behalf of our constituency. And uh, now uh, the Mayor of Kitchener and UCLG Governing President, uh, Mayor Bravanovich, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Emilia. Your Excellency Executive Director of UN Habitat, Maimouna Mod Sharif, Excellencies, Ministers, Mayors, Governors, local government officials and partners. It's an honor to be here with all of you at this 11th edition of the World Urban Forum in Katowice, taking part in the World Assembly of Local and Regional Governments on behalf of the Global Task Force. Allow me to thank our hosts from the Government of Poland, the City of Katowice, 
and UN Habitat for securing the celebration of the World Urban Forum and the World Assembly. We meet today as mayors and governors in a very delicate context in Europe. As we are returning in many instances to scenarios of conflict between national governments, it is local and regional governments that are again at the front lines. During these years, we have seen local and regional governments redouble their efforts in safeguarding the most vulnerable populations, women, children, older populations, impoverished people, and migrants and refugees are at the most risk. I am sure that this message rings truer in Poland, a country whose cities are rising up to the challenges of war in a neighboring country by doing what they do best, by caring for all populations, by providing services to all, by welcoming refugees, and becoming, in many instances, the last safe havens for situations of conflict. We are gathered here to value the important role of local and regional governments in complex situations, of course, but also to take stock and review how far we are from the goals we set for ourselves in 2015 and 2016. Just two months ago, we met in New York at the high-level meeting on the implementation of the new urban agenda to take stock and review the implementation of the new urban agenda. In April in New York, we reinstated our commitment as a constituency to achieving the new urban agenda, understanding its potential as an accelerator for the SDGs, as a lever for all of the universal development agendas. As mayors and as municipalists, we cannot understate its value and we need to bring everyone on board. The role of local and regional governments as a lever for transformation is becoming more and more evident. All of the lessons that the pandemic has taught us can only be put to the test if local and regional governments are included in decision-making processes at all levels and if the international system responds to the needs of all actors. This means that we need to address the renewal of the multilateral system to respond to the challenges and opportunities of the urban era. We need to develop a system in which local and regional governments are fully engaged by holding a permanent seat at the decision-making tables, representing their communities and able to build peace and sustainability from the bottom up. Only by transforming the international system, by giving all stakeholders voice and a seat at the table, will we ensure a renewed social contract anchored in human rights. This is the way to shape the future between and amongst generations, to deliver global public goods, and to adapt the international system and the way we govern ourselves to the challenges and the opportunities of the current era, placing our communities and local democracy at the center. Excellencies, dear mayors, it is in difficult times when the opportunity arises to build a better future. We need to harness the transformative potential of our agendas, build back from the pandemic, and face the challenges together. The commitment and actions of all actors remain essential to transform our systems. We stand ready to enshrine the principles of the new urban agenda. We stand ready to be partners for transformation, to co-construct peace and resilience in our territories, to protect our planet, and to transform commitments into actions through the localization of the various agendas. Allow me to finish my intervention with this call, one that rings true today as it did in April and as it did when we met in Abu Dhabi in 2020, before our world changed forever. Local and regional governments are partners, and they need full support to jointly achieve the global agendas. We urge national governments and the international system to see us as such, to bring the conversation beyond competences and powers, and to consider the co-creation of our future. 
We need to reposition local and regional governments in the international system with a view to truly transforming governance systems and the future of our cities, our territories, and of course, our communities to achieve the future which we all dream of. Thank you very much. Chunkuya. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Governing President, for providing this, uh, this vision. One, one of the strong legacies that this World Assembly carries with it is the capacity that local and regional governments have had to uh, strategize and to partner with civil society um, and with other stakeholders. And for the first time, I feel that we are start, starting to consolidate this, and it will be visible, very visible, throughout this World Assembly, because many of them, those critical partners, are with us uh, today. It has always been the case that traditionally we have had uh, other stakeholders represented, but I think it is the first time that we have them in numbers. And I think that evolution is worth, uh, is worth uh, highlighting. Uh, one of the things about change is you need to recognize it, the good and the bad. And I think there are good changes that are happening in this uh, multi-level governance of ours that will actually help us move forward this notion that we all believe in, which is local multilateralism, networked multilateralism, towards our common agenda. So we are going to be hearing many voices and uh, many mayors and governors but also uh, stakeholders. Allow me to start uh, with, uh, with one of those uh, strong voices from local and regional uh, governments. Uh, the mayor of Bogota, incoming president of Metropolis, is here with us today. Uh, Claudia, bienvenida. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Emilia. Emilia and dear friends, for the sake of time, allow me to overcome all the <clears throat> diplomacy and greetings to start with. I'm very proud to be here working with all of you and having this great opportunity to follow up this uh, common first and great achievement that we had uh, to have this high level meeting uh, and speaking by first time on behalf of all, all our citizens and local and regional governments in the United Nations General Assembly some months ago. So as a follow-up to that great uh, historic moment and point, let me propose some actions and some strategic actions and debates maybe that we should push and move forward during our meeting here in the United, um, uh, in the Global Urban Forum. First of all, we have here, and on behalf of local governments, but there are many different types of local governments. There are some governments such as mine in Bogota in the context of a presidential government, national government, what by, by general Latin American standards is a fair enough, well-developed decentralization country. Uh, Bogota is a strong local government in general, and municipal governments in Colombia are fair enough strong local governments. We are in charge of some of the most important social services, such as delivering child care, education, at least basic and secondary education, health services. That's why we were crucial at the pandemic, because we were actually in charge of providing health services directly to the population. Um, but that's not the case of all local governments around the world. There are still many mayors who are dealing with the problems that national states create to us, whether it is war, migration, climate change, so on and so forth, and we are just dealing with the consequences of the national and global decisions with whatever we have at hand. So I think the one thing that we should uh, propose in this multilateralism, local multilateralism, is to deepen uh, decentralization in our countries. To be able to put the money where the citizens are, which means at our cities and local governments. To be able to put the capacities, both technical and political and 
civil society capacities where they are and where they serve the best, which is at the local level with our citizens. Fiscal decentralization, technical and political decentralization, making sure that at the local level throughout the world, we have the technical, political, and fiscal capacity to deliver services of care. And when I, it's not social services with care. It's in addition to social services, services of care. And let me explain what I mean by that. Half of the world's population are female. Half of Bogota's population are female, are women. In Latin America, half of the jobs are informal, meaning no minimum wage is secure, no health care is secure along with job, and no pension is a kind of a luxury is ensured with jobs. But we are all, at some point in our lives, children and need care. We are all, at some point in our lives, elders, and we need care. At some point in our life, we face health issues, and we need care. And many members of our families are dealing, are facing disabilities, and they need special care. So if there is no national social security system to provide that care, who's providing that care? Women are providing that care. The unpaid care work of women is the actual social security of half of the population in Latin America, of a third of the population of Bogota, which is a city of 8 million people. 1.2 million women in my city provide unpaid care work that both the private and public sector should be provided instead of them. It means 1.2 million women is in poverty because they are providing that care. If we want to relieve, and we must relieve, women from the overburden of unpaid care work, then care provision, care redistribution, care services, so that we relieve those women from time, for the, having time for themselves, not only for their kids and families, but for themselves. Providing them education, education and political empowerment and social organization, and providing them a decent living with economic autonomy by getting a job. That's what I mean by providing care services. But women are not going to abandon. No woman in the world is going to abandon to those that they care for. So a care service should care for those that they care for, for children, for child care service, for education, for extra school time, should care for people with disabilities, and should care for the elders, so that women can be relieved of that unpaid care work and have time, education, political and social empowerment, and economic autonomy. That's care services. That's what the care system of Bogota is providing right now for 120,000 women in Bogota. And we hope to reach out in the next years to a million women in our city so that they can voice decent living, economic empowerment, and political representation. That's going to democratize Bogota. That's going to democratize. That's going to be better not only for women, for society as a whole, and for democracy as a whole. Those are the kind of care services that I'm talking about. And if anyone here in this room in the world is not in charge, fiscally, politically, and technically, of those kind of services, then we're not going to meet the new urban agenda, period. So let's make and ensure that the decentralization allowed us to do this, in addition to the education and health and social services that we provide, and also to the water, electricity, and other public services that we should provide. That's what I mean by deepening decentralization in our countries, in our local governments, and making always sure that we work and provide together with the so civil society and community-based allies those services. But at the same time, there is other side of the coin. For some things and services, 
we should strengthen decentralization. And in order to have the political voice at the global level that we are claiming for local and regional governments, instead of decentralizing, we should organize better, associate better. I was talking right, uh, some moments ago with my dear friend Ernest Maragall about building not only, for example, metropolitan areas that unify efforts of different municipalities to provide better services, but for example, to unite regional, local governments and civil society in regional, in metropolitan regions, not areas, so that we are better able to take care, for example, of climate change challenges, of water provision, of food security. That's something we're not going to meet or do in our local cities. You know, the food is not provided at the city level. We consume the food, but we don't produce it. But we better align regionally with those who produce our food, with those do, that produce our water, with those that produce our energy, and work together instead of having this competition or non-related worlds. So for many of, for our political purposes globally, and when I mean political, I mean the climate change agenda, I mean the new urban agenda, I mean the gender agenda that unified us philosophically, but we need to deliver and to have a voice and to have representation. So for, those of, for some of those topics, decentralization is the key. But for other topics, you know, metropolization is the key. So we need to work on those two levels. And finally, at the global level, we are so glad. I was one of the four mayors that had the honor to speak on behalf of all of you by first time in the General Assembly. It's a great honor. But we don't want a, an invitation. We want a place. And that should be our goal, to convince the United Nations General Assembly that we should be part somehow of the General Assembly, of the decisions. National states cannot continue going to war and leaving us the consequences. National states cannot continue expulsing people prevent or preventing them at national borders. If they don't want to have prevent people brutally at their national borders, they better invest in including them in whatever city they are living in. They are citizens of the world, so that we have to include them in any city they want to live in. Those are the kind of topics that we need to discuss there, where the very problems and challenges are created. And finally, if we continue in a world in which young men are forced to war in Ukraine or in Colombia or in any place, and women are forced to unpaid care work instead of realizing their potential. No agenda, no place, no person, no planet will be possible. So let's work together to make sure that this is not continue the state of the affairs in the world we live in. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is what feminist municipal leadership looks like. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. It's a different type of leadership that looks at care from a different perspective. We want to go even further, and we want to also ensure that care uh, obliges us and drives us to look at the different way at the commons that we have. The commons need to have a different space in our discussions and in our policies. And we have seen during the pandemic how relevant this is, how much we need to take care of public space if we want to ensure the security and the health of everyone. Um, but also how some of the basic services provisions that are, uh, that are ensured by local governments should not be privatized in the way that we have seen them privatized, that they need to be part of the commons, no matter what agreement you have with the, uh, with the private sector. There needs to remain um, a, a common uh, management of them. And we have worked uh, hard uh, with the International Union of Public Transport to ensure that the important role that public transport has in facing many of the challenges of our agenda is, is visible. It's visible by the people, it's visible by the international community. I'm really delighted to have with us today one of those important stakeholders for us, 
represented by the Secretary General of the International Union of Public Transport, Mohamed Mesgani. Thank you, Mohamed, for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emilia, and good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, mayors, uh, and, and dear friends and governors as well. So, so uh, it's an honor for, uh, for me to be here with you today and uh, in this roundtable about uh, the new urban agenda under review. Uh, I am uh, speaking on behalf of UITP, which is the International Association of Public Transport. It's a 137 years old uh, organization gathering 1,900 uh, public transport operators, uh, regulators, and supplying uh, industry from 100 countries on all continents. Uh, cities and, and, and metropolitan uh, areas host uh, half of the world population now, and this percentage is growing fast to reach 70% by 20, 2050. Cities generate uh, more than 80% of, of the global GDP. And I would say these two figures, in addition to what we have uh, listened also uh, now from the mayor of, 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 Bog of Bogota, uh, show the weight and the importance of cities and, uh, and, and their key role. And, uh, of course, I will speak from the perspective of public transport and urban mobility. So, and I would like to focus on the three dimensions when we speak about sustainability and about sustainable mobility, which are economic, environmental, and the social uh, dimension. So first, starting with the economic dimension, uh, when we invest one euro or one dollar or one zloty in developing public transport, it creates four euros in the local economy, four times more than the investment. Also, for the same amount of money invested, public transport creates 25% more jobs than road construction. And uh, speaking about jobs, uh, generally speaking, public transport is amongst the uh, largest uh, employers in the city. I have two examples in mind, Amsterdam, Brussels. The first employer in those cities is public, uh, public transport. And these are local jobs. They cannot be relocated somewhere else in the world. So these are very very precious uh, jobs we need, to, uh, we need to, to, to keep. Second dimension is the environmental dimension. Transport, and you, you all know, represent 25% to 30% of the CO2 emissions and the large part of the air, air pollution. And 95% of those emissions are related to road transport, and half of it is uh, related to cars. So cars represent 50% of those emissions. And 70% of those emissions take place in cities and in urban areas. So it shows what is at stake. And I would like to make the link with public transport. Public transport uh, uh, emits or ne needs five times less energy than cars for every passenger transported. So despite all these important challenges and all this uh, evidence, uh, only 35% of the countries, they have included public transport in their national climate plans. Our aim is to have every country including public transport in their national climate plans. And the third dimension is the social dimension. Of course, public transport offers mobility for all. It's by definition. But also in terms of road safety, there is a scientific evidence showing that when there is more public transport, we have less traffic fatalities. And also, we all know, if we look to the health dimension, that uh, public transport users walk much more than car users. They are less, less exposed to obesity and or to cardiovascular diseases, for example. And there, are, there is, of course, evidence of that. So these are some elements that illustrate what is at stake in the field of uh, urban mobility. And uh, many recent events are making those challenges even more critical. Think about the climate emergency, of course, the IPCC report recently, the COVID pandemic, which has uh, demonstrated the essential role of public transport when the cities closed their doors, the doors of public transport remained open uh, for the essential workers, for those who have no choice. And now, if you look to the war in Ukraine and with its impact on the energy supply and the energy prices. So we don't have any other choice than ending the domination of cars in our cities and give back the urban space to people. So we must move, we must move people uh, and not cars. And by prioritizing, of course, walking first, cycling and, and public transport. And it's obvious that the future of urban mobility should be mobility putting people at the heart 
uh, mobility without cars as much as possible, or at least with much, much less individual use of cars. And even if those cars are electric or automated, it will not change the issue because a clean traffic jam is still traffic jam. So it's about pu pu putting people uh, at the heart. And I will, uh, I will finish with one challenge, one important challenge, funding. Funding is an, is an important challenge, of course. But one good news, despite the crisis, is that public transport projects have not been stopped because of COVID. Even some cities, they took the, the they say the opportunity of having, a, 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 let's say, a, a lockdowns and slow, slowdown of the activity to accelerate the construction of public transport uh, projects. But we need more investments in public transport. We need more investment, and uh, we can't just depend on budget decisions. We need structural funding instruments. And two examples. First, congestion charging. It must be more widely used. This is one element for the funding. And also land value capture. Land value capture, capture should be implemented. It's not normal that uh, the benefits of public transport are leveraged by real estate and land developers. They leverage the benefits of, of, of public transport and without paying back a single penny to public transport. So this revenue has to go back to public transport. And local and regional governments will have a key role to make this, this happen. So to conclude, the motto of this year, World Urban Forum, is transforming our cities for a better future. Urban mobility will play a key role in that, uh, in that uh, future with public transport uh, as its, uh, its backbone. And this is the only way to address the climate challenge while improving at the same time safety, accessibility, health, and keeping our cities prosperous and ensuring the well-being of people. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mohamed. One of the challenges that we are facing with dealing, when, when dealing with public transport, but also with our public service delivery, is that very often we talk about that public service delivery with the final aim to facilitate going to work or going back to, from work. And the reality is that many of those public service delivery are used by women that do not have formal jobs. And so we need to reshape uh, that, that common good. And if we want to make that transformation, our understanding of the level of inequalities that is acceptable for us should change and actually not accept any inequality. So I think in, in our work together, we need to find a way to put that also in the discussion when talking about funding of, of public service uh, um, uh, and, 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 and public, uh, public transport. But thank you very much uh, for your inspiring partnership, dear friend. And let us go now to once again to, to the voice of an elected uh, official, Ernest Maragall is the Vice President of International Relations and Cooperation of the Barcelona metropolitan area. We, we have talked about this uh, uh, president. Um, and th there are many things that a city alone cannot do, and we, we need to rethink how democracy is shaped in, in changing boundaries eh, of, of territories and the role that metropolitan areas or metropolitan regions need to, need to play. Uh, the floor to you, President. Thank you, thank you, Emilia. Uh, si no les importa, lo voy a hablar en, en castellano. ¿no? También para que también esta lengua esté presente en esta, en esta sesión. Con permiso. Yo les saludo desde la institución que define el área metropolitana de Barcelona. Barcelona es la capital de Cataluña, una de las grandes ciudades del sur de Europa, todos ustedes lo saben, uno de los grandes puertos del Mediterráneo. De manera que hoy es, yo me siento especialmente responsabilizado de estar aquí y de responder a la convocatoria de UN Habitat y de, y de CGLU, de Ciudades y Gobiernos Locales Unidos. Y en este World Urban Forum, que me parece que tiene no solo la, toda la oportunidad, sino también toda la exigencia de responder a unas expectativas que están hoy encima de nuestras, de nuestras reflexiones, de nuestras ocupaciones. ¿Por qué nos reunimos hoy aquí, en Katowice, ciudades, áreas metropolitanas, gobiernos locales y regionales de todo el mundo? Desde luego tenemos mucho que hablar, como siempre. Ya lo hemos estado haciendo, ahora mismo transporte público, urbanismo, movilidad, economía, servicios públicos, 
gestión de residuos, suministro de agua, infraestructuras, etc. Pero yo estoy convencido de que están ustedes de acuerdo en que estamos aquí también, o quizás sobre todo, porque hay unas cuantas cuestiones sobrevenidas, cuestiones nuevas, cuestiones que hace pocos años no estaban en nuestra agenda urbana o no aparecían con el carácter trascendental que hoy reconocemos. Control de la energía, suficiencia alimentaria, suministro de materiales estratégicos para nuestras industrias y nuestra economía, pandemia y crisis sanitaria, migraciones masivas. Estas son las cuestiones de fondo que nos convocan hoy aquí, creo yo. Hoy tenemos que hablar de violencia, de conflicto armado, de muerte, y esas son las palabras que ocupan nuestro primer plano, terriblemente. Vamos a hablar claro, los Estados aprueban las leyes, deciden las guerras, esgrimen la razón de Estado, dibujan las líneas de sus respectivas visiones geopolíticas. Por otro lado, las grandes corporaciones privadas nos ofrecen sus marcas y sus franquicias, ocupan y muchas veces se apropian de nuestro espacio público, de los mejores emplazamientos urbanos, imponen las reglas de mercado libre, nos venden la luz y el gas a precio de oro y naturalmente se llevan una parte importante de los beneficios, desde mi punto de vista una parte demasiado importante. ¿Y las ciudades? Las ciudades ponemos el carácter propio, ponemos el nombre para las noticias, ponemos el espacio y los servicios públicos, nuestra historia, nuestras escuelas, nuestros hospitales, la ciudadanía, los y las trabajadoras y sobre todo ponemos las víctimas de todo eso. Estamos a 300 kilómetros del BIF, a 900 de Kiev, donde aún resuenan los últimos bombardeos. Estamos cerca de fronteras manchadas de sangre, en Melilla, en El Paso, en Siria, donde sea, en todo el mundo. Estamos, a pesar de todo, cerca de Ubalde o de Oslo, donde ayer mismo sucedía lo que sucedía. Estamos no lejos en el tiempo de Barcelona hace cinco años, de París, de Londres, de Nueva York y no muy lejos tampoco de la guerra de los Balcanes y Sarajevo, de inmenso recuerdo también para Barcelona muy especialmente. De manera que hay una primera conclusión, la globalización sin gobernación genera contradicciones y conflictos de interés de carácter político pero también económico, conflictos fuera de control aparente que no parecen ofrecer otra salida que la victoria o la derrota de unos u otros. Esos conflictos implican a los grandes estados y a las organizaciones internacionales como la Unión Europea, pero también ocupan, por cierto, a esas grandes corporaciones privadas, actuando muchas veces como agentes directos y muchas otras como responsables invisibles, pero no menos efectivos. Conflictos se colocan en las ciudades como objeto, como lugar y escenario del horror, pero que las dejan, no os dejan en la indefensión. La guerra se ha convertido en el arte de destrucción de las ciudades. Y esto es terrible. La pregunta es, pues, cómo pasamos de objeto a sujeto, ¿Cómo pasamos de espectadores de nuestro propio horror a actores de nuestra esperanza? Claro que hemos de mostrar nuestra mejor capacidad para mitigar, aliviar, acoger, proteger. Es lo que están haciendo muy especialmente las ciudades del país que nos acoge hoy, de Polonia. Y también en menor medida de muchas otras ciudades europeas, incluidas las, la mía y muchas otras de nuestro país. Pero no podemos quedarnos en la función subalterna de gestionar las consecuencias de los conflictos. Sabemos que el conflicto actual requiere esfuerzos militares y que no podemos frivolizar en base a nuestras buenas intenciones. Hay que acabar con la guerra y hay que, y hay que hacerlo desde el más absoluto respeto al derecho a defenderse de Ucrania. Como Estado y como ciudades directamente agredidas, bombardeadas, destruidas, como Mariupol. Pero también debemos mirar adelante a un futuro próximo y exigente que no puede instalarse en el conflicto sistemático o en la gestión de emergencias o de situaciones cada vez más críticas para nuestra ciudadanía. Un futuro capaz de prevenir y evitar conflictos como los que estamos viviendo. La gran cuestión para todos nosotros hoy es cómo afrontamos la contradicción de fondo entre autoritarismo y democracia. Digámoslo alto y claro, en este combate las ciudades representamos la democracia la capacidad de crear libertad individual y colectiva, la posibilidad de definir la más amplia concreción de derechos sociales y políticos, de servicios públicos orientados a la defensa del interés general. Ciudad es sinónimo hoy cada vez más de realidad metropolitana. Quiere decir red de ciudades, quiere decir red de ciudades y territorios trabajando juntos por la soberanía energética y por la soberanía alimentaria. 
quiere decir creación de realidad social en complicidad positiva e imprescindible con la iniciativa privada. La cuestión, pues, es cómo las ciudades hoy alzamos la voz, cómo desde nuestras redes y asociaciones internacionales, CGLU, Metrópolis, Méxites, etc., rompemos barreras geopolíticas, atravesamos fronteras nacionales, nos plantamos ante los Estados y las grandes asociaciones internacionales, incluyendo a Naciones Unidas y sus agencias. UN Habitat es y debe ser nuestro mejor aliado. Debe convertirse también en nuestro altavoz, en la vía directa para llegar a los grandes Estados y para intervenir efectivamente en los debates decisivos sobre energía, materias primas y grandes migraciones internacionales. Pasemos de la gestión a la gobernación, de la denuncia a la iniciativa, de la protesta a la propuesta, del silencio al clamor ciudadano, de objetos a sujetos. Somos ciudades, hagámonos plenamente responsables de nuestro futuro. Muchas gracias. No, eso también es, es liderazgo feminista municipalista. Eso también lo es. Muchas gracias, presidente. Y metropolitano, efectivamente, Claudia. Um, a, new sense, a, a new sense of care, a new sense of obligation, going from, uh, sub to, from object to, to subject is what we are asking for. This is what is behind this notion that we don't want to be seen only as mere implementers. And this is why also when they keep asking us for a roadmap of action, we also say that the responsibility of local and regional government leaders like yourselves is also to provide the vision. There is no action without a vision. We would just get lost, and you are hearing it here this afternoon. Allow me to go now to a, a very important uh, voice uh, for us from, from these partnerships, uh, Habitat International Coalition. Habitat International Coalition has played a very important role uh, in, in bringing uh, the notion of right to the city to our, uh, to our table and to uh, make us understand uh, housing from a very different perspective than mere uh, buildings, uh, right? So the work that we have done together, I think, will mark our agenda for the future, and I am very happy to have Adriana Allen uh, with us uh, here uh, today, president of Habitat International Coalition and a trusted partner of, of local and regional governments. Not always easy, our conversations, uh, Adriana, but always very fruitful. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Emilia, and always a pleasure. Uh, first of all, I, I want to, in speaking on behalf of Habitat International Coalition, but also of the social movements, feminist movements, uh, grassroots organizations and networks of civil society, I want to say a very big thanks for engaging us in this critical conversation. This is not usual. We know that this is usual with you, Emilia. We know that this is becoming usual with you, CLC, but it's not usual and it's crucial. Um, I think that before uh, I go back to what I see, the critical agenda and the critical job that we need to do together, it's worth to uh, just to remind ourselves of how much we have achieved in a very short period of time and in a recent period of time um, by working together. And I think that, again, it's not enough to highlight what we have done. Uh, it's not, COVID is not that far away. The pandemic is not that far away. We had, in a very short period of time, let's remember, we have to generate new ways of communicating, new, new ways of creating social and political proximity in a context of distance, in a context of remoteness. And that's not a, that's not a minor thing. We also have learned that not only a structural, but timely change, a timely and a structural change takes time and depends on key alliances. And this is why we value this alliance. We are not here, I take very much and I follow uh, uh, the previous speaker when he was saying, we are not here to protest, we are here to work with you. Uh, we shouldn't forget when we look at the, uh, the last few years, the enormous capacities we, what, that we have displayed when working together. Uh, we have mobilized all resources at hand, we have a wider network of kind support, 
we have engaged in swift efforts to decommodify access to housing, access to health, access to education, uh, access to transport. And we have done this together and in a very short period of time. You know the story, you know how much we have achieved, but we have to keep on reminding ourselves because we have done things together that seem to be impossible just before the pandemic. Uh, so we should remember not only the discovery that inequality wasn't the outcome of a pandemic, but very much you know, a, a condition underpinning uh, the pandemic and the times we have gone through, but we, have also, we also need to remind ourselves of what can be produced with ingenuity, with political commitment, and with care. Civil society organizations and local and regional governments are closer to the ear, closer to the ground, closer to uh, the possibility of knowing and understanding what needs to be changed. And today we have very important reframings of what that change means. I just want to add or emphasize uh, what we see as the most critical elements of a core and common agenda. First, and we haven't talked so much about that, uh, but we need to confront the increasing uh, financialization of housing and land. This is essential. I mean, this was again mentioned by my predecessors when speaking about how cities have become machines, yeah? machines of producing profitability. And the, the, the notion of profitability is completely contaminating the notions of accessibility, of affordability, of life. We cannot forget that. There is a massive, massive fight that we need to, to get uh, to fight there in that uh, area. And we have done that. We have done that recently. We also need to reset the talks and the, uh, I would say, sideline commitments on climate change into much more concrete actions to advance climate justice and remind ourselves that the two things are not the same. And we have gone through too many iterations of COPs, of years of talk and talk and talk that are not delivering the changes we need. This is essential and again, this is something that Claudia and others have highlighted. The third point that for us is crucial was uh, very eloquently put forward by Claudia, so I'm not going to even to try, but is we clearly need to privilege our focus on care. And I really love the notion of how thinking, this means thinking about care in a very different way. This means about thinking about those that fall through the net of care and those that are overburdened by the responsibility of caring. I'm talking about women, I'm talking about migrants, I'm talking about tenants, I'm talking about the youth. This, this is a burden agenda and we cannot overlook it. We have, as Claudia well said, no chance if we do that. We also have to actively challenge, and, and, and apologies for repeating this, but we have to actively challenge the deeply racialized and patriarchal systems that still rule our societies. And I'm not talking about academic concepts. I'm talking about things that reproduce every day through labor markets, through housing markets, through transport, through every aspect of life, we see patriarchal systems, we see racialized systems. We do have to talk about that, and we have to talk about what we do. So in a nutshell, we are, uh, we are here to stay. We are here to continue working with you. And I just want to highlight that uh, we are here to you, to work with you, not, and we don't see our role as fulfilling, as the role of the third sector in fulfilling the hollowing, yeah, this, the vacuum left by the hollowing of the state. We see our role, the role of civil society and organized civil society as working together, together with local and regional governments in crafting a completely different generation of public policies that deliver the change we need. We also see ourselves as partners in political parity. Thank you for that. Thank you very much, Adrián. I always say that our partnership holds us accountable as local and regional governments. That is something that we need to ensure. But it's also very important how, and I have learned this over time, uh, how important
important it is for local and regional government leaders to also be encouraged by your narrative and by, by ensuring that what they are trying to do reflects on the values that the communities that, that uh, you represent uh, from civil society. So yeah, I, I am certain. Uh, our partnership is here to stay and we're trying to change the world. It's not a small detail that we are working <laughs> on. That fact for the future is a new social contract and we are going to ensure that we are critical actors in the common agenda of the United Nations Secretary General. Hopefully we will talk about some progress that we have been making there later today and following the remarks of the opening ceremony. So let us go now to a councillor from Johannesburg, the chairperson of the Human Settlements Working Group of the South African Local Government Association, uh, Cholani Sostache. Welcome, uh, councillor. Thank you for being with us again. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Secretary General. Uh, I think uh, the COVID-19 has di disrupted our interface, but uh, we are back again uh, at work to make sure that uh, we do things the way that are supposed to be. I want to preface our contribution from a different angle because the, the title speaks about reviewing the new urban agenda. In my own view, this is not a new debate, Secretary General. The new urban agenda was adopted, I think, in the eighth session of, um, of WOOF which there are other sessions before that that had uh, serious discussions where we ended up uh, adopting the new urban agenda. Now, in reviewing the new urban agenda, we need to review um, a program that has been tested because you can't review something that has not been tested. We need to be able to say what has worked, what has not worked, so that we can be able to isolate the areas where we strongly believe that these areas are not taking us forward. We are only left with eight years to realize the, our own objective in terms of the targets that we set for ourselves. Because when we adopted the new urban agenda, we identified 2030 as our target year to realize the new urban agenda. Maybe then the question would be, how far have we come as regional governments and local governments in realizing the objectives of 2030, the new urban agenda? So we are on the 11th um, World Forum, which is uh, important uh, to look back and review progress and the commitments we have made since WOOF 1. Of course, we must focus particularly on the progress since Quito where we adopted the new urban agenda as we know it. Note that we are only left with eight years before 2030, as I indicated earlier. In South Africa, I, I am going to use also this platform just to give a sense of a report back of how far have we gone in South Africa in implementing the aspirations of the new urban agenda. In South Africa, we have developed our own progress report on the new urban agenda. The details shall be presented when the opportunity comes. One of the, th one of the key things that the new urban agenda requires is for the countries to adopt a specific urban policies. In South Africa, the cabinet has adopted an urban policy called the Integrated Urban Development Framework, which becomes the blueprint for all the um, spheres of government in South Africa to do proper planning and, and coordination. Um, we have more recently developed a program of action for the urban, I mean for the um, integrated urban development framework. The implementation plan categorizes urban spaces into three major parts. One, the metropolitan cities. Two, the intermediate cities and lastly, the small towns. So various partners have been given responsibilities to coordinate uh, which one of those is us as South African Local Government Association, which is SAGA. 
we coordinate the small towns regeneration. Um, the other department within uh, uh, our own central government, which is COCTA, um, is coordinating the intermediate cities. And our national treasury has established a, a city support program that coordinates support to these metropolitan cities. These are the main key issues that the review of the new urban agenda must consider, such as rapid urbanization, the disruptive uh, technology, and the climate change. Talking about the climate change, I'm sure you might have seen and read about what is going on in South Africa. One of our provinces is faced with uh, unprecedented um, uh, weather conditions. Uh, I'm sure you might have seen what has happened in the a province called the KwaZulu Natal, uh, where the, the government of KwaZulu Natal, I think they have quantified um, the losses through this uh, climate change, uh, which uh, cost, is going to cost the province around about 25 billion rands, which they did not budget for. And these were the discussions that we had when we adopted the new urban agendas, which I think, in my view, we were supposed also to look at unforeseen circumstances. Um, these are the four unforeseen circumstances that becomes the reality now uh, today. So I, I think the, as I conclude our, 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 our debate, on, I mean, sorry, our interface on this particular item, maybe we should pose a question that says we need to do a serious introspection as individual governments, local governments, in terms of the decisions that we have taken. How far have we gone in assisting each other to respond to the assumptions that are contained in the new urban agenda document? Thank you very much. Well, Councillor, I think it's one of the most brilliant summaries of what multi-level governance and governing in partnership could look like. I mean, it's about co-creating and being, being critical with one another and, and seeing how far subsidiarity needs to go, right? Because subsidiarity is not only from the bottom up or the, bo or the, the, top, the top down, it's, it's just as important. Um, it is important that everybody has their own responsibilities and it's also important that all the spheres of government can actually advise on what they see the communities need. And, and it is not always about competencies, but about what people that you represent care for. I think it's a very good way to, to, to look at that. Also, on, on national urban policies, our, our concern was always um, if national governments were going to use those to centralize decision making. And to a certain extent, we have seen how that has happened a little bit in some parts of the, of, of the world. So it is an exercise, it is, it, it is an exercise that we need to look at uh, uh, critically. And, and I think uh, the uh, UN Habitat is, is an excellent space to do that. Um, so I, I hope that we can ask our colleagues to, to open up those spaces for dialogue and uh, and we'll take note of that. Allow me to go now to another very important part of city making, which is um, the, the workers. Um, and uh, in, in order to provide uh, some feedback on how we look at, at, at uh, our work together, I've got Daria uh, Chivrario here, uh, policy officer in charge of the local and regional governments, workers, and multinational enterprises of Public Service International. Our partnership um, has, has been long, and we have worked a lot in, in, in the road towards Habitat uh, 3, but I would say that we have really met each other in the hardest moment of the pandemic when the public workers were risking their lives, literally, uh, to, to ensure service provision when we were, many of us, locked down at, at home. Uh, Daria, thank you for uh, being with us, and the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much, uh, uh, dear Emilia, excellencies, distinguished uh, UCLG delegates uh, and partners. Uh, thanks for your words. And I would like, first of all, to open by commending the very strong pro-public and pro-public service messages that I've heard here today. It is a pleasure and an honor for me to contribute to this World uh, uh, Assembly of Local and Regional Governments here at the 11th World Urban Forum in Katowice on behalf uh, of our constituency, Public Services International Global Union. We represent over 30 million uh, workers in public services worldwide, and their majority are from local and regional government uh, services. That means that our members are your employees, and two-thirds of those are women. They are those who bring care to your community. They are the nurses who had to be in the front lines uh, and in the trenches of uh, COVID. They are the firefighters and the emergency responders who have to run when everyone else has to go away because climate-induced uh, 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 extreme weather events uh, are striking and when there's war and uh, strife on the ground. So, there, and there's so many of uh, these local government professions, uh, hundreds of them, you know that very well, and they make the wealth and the rich diversity of our public services at the local level. Our members, your employees, are those who implement global, national, and uh, local policy frameworks on the ground. Uh, the new urban agenda, the sustainable development goals, but also the Sendai protocol and the COP agreements with their hands, with their brains, but also with their hearts, with uh, a strong commitment to public policy, to public institutions, and to their communities. But there's one global policy framework that we hardly hear about, including in UN, in, uh, UN Habitat, although this was uh, enclosed uh, as a transformative commitment in the new urban agenda, and that is the commitment to decent work as intended by the International Labour Organization. Indeed, and you know that all too well, the lack of uh, adequate funding and the devolution of uh, competences to local governments without adequate funding is taking a toll not only on local government services, but on the workers who deliver those services themselves. Many of them work in extremely difficult conditions. They lack the working tools and the vocational training to deliver quality public services everywhere, anywhere, so that we can fight inequality together. We can fight the climate crisis. We can uh, stop uh, conflict and warfare, and we can create the bedrock for peace. But as we convene here together uh, with you, uh, local authorities uh, from the world, we feel as a public service workers union that there's a huge opportunity to work together even more so after the terrible experience we've uh, lived together uh, through COVID. And this is because on the front lines, we are together. It's you with policies, it's us delivering those policies and servicing the community on the ground. So when we come together through constructive social dialogue, we can be much stronger, much more effective to making sure that local government has what it needs to deliver and to beat the challenges of our time. So as I read the background paper of uh, the World uh, Urban Forum 11, I also read uh, that there's uh, a need to move away radically from unsustainable practices, that there's a need to look back and correct the mistakes of the past. And in our view, and I've heard it today, one of the key mistakes has been and continues to be the commercialization of life-saving public services that are overwhelmingly delivered uh, on the ground by local government and by your employees. The privatization and the commercialization, blended finance, public-private par partnerships of uh, health, of care, of water, of electricity are failing 
the uh, sustainable development goals and are becoming the obstacle to the implementation of the transformative commitment of the new urban agenda. Our members in privatized services have to work in uh, precarious conditions. They do not, they have often zero hour employment contracts. They are overwhelmingly exposed to lack of uh, uh, social security and lack of training. But together we can redress and fix this and reclaim local public services in the common interest on a public goods approach by deprivatizing them and by changing the course of things. Since we are here to propose actions, uh, I would really like to propose three points that are going to take our partnership and dialogue further, dear Emilia and dear colleagues uh, uh, and representatives of uh, UCLG. We have a, a, a joint declaration on uh, uh, um, continued service delivery at times of COVID, and that has been absolutely critical for our membership on the ground by encouraging them to engage in dialogue with the authorities to ensure that the services can continue to be delivered in sufficient quality, equitably, and in a way that it is safe for both workers and users. But to do that, we can go further. We must work together locally, continentally, and globally to demand three things. First of all, and I've heard it again, adequate funding for local government services, including investment in infrastructure, public investment, but also inadequate staffing. Colleagues and partners, we hear so often uh, about packages for the post-COVID recovery that uh, foresee the building of infrastructure, but no provision for working people. In Italy, two 20,000 uh, crash education primary school workers are missing, yet the government is only investing in uh, uh, building crash, but not in hiring the workers who have to provide that service. And we would like to look at new innovative ways of funding public services with you. For example, revaluing the role of local and municipal public banks and finding new ways to keep public procurement, which is huge at the subnational level in the territory, so that it can come back and fuel uh, public municipal finances by keeping it in the, co in the community. Second, we want uh, to work with you to stop the disappearance of local public services, the desertification of territories. And this is something that, for instance, our affiliate Unison is doing, working with your uh, member, local government association in the UK. We can reclaim together by remunicipalizing and de deprivatizing vital uh, local public services. There is a global database that shows uh, that today 1,582 municipalities have, have brought public local services back into their uh, realm because it's cheaper and it's more effective than having them outsource. We can do that together more and more. And last proposal, we as trade unions in public services, we absolutely support the inclusion of local government authorities and constituencies in the multilateral system, and we want to support you in the advocacy for its democratization. We've already supported you in the inclusion of UCLG in the UN Water uh, Board, and we continue to advocate relentlessly for the key role that UCLG and local authorities uh, uh, play at the International Labour Organization. Thank you very much for this space, and we hope we can continue to work together even more so than ever. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Daria, for, for the continued partnership of PSI, but also for those very concrete proposals to, to work about, I think, um, as, as, as global task force uh, 
we have discussed uh, uh, about decent jobs, but probably you are right, not, not enough. And now that we are enhancing uh, the discussions around the space for public service provision, also in the achievement of the sustainable development goals, um, it, it is something that, we, that is worth uh, looking at. Uh, certainly, thank you very much for your support to encourage the multilateral system to include us uh, at, the, at the table. So allow me now to go to, uh, to the mayor of the city of Pereira, Carlos, uh, Carlos Maya, uh, para que nos dé su, su perspectiva. Muy buenos días para todos. Muchísimas gracias por la invitación. Es para mí un honor venir de una ciudad intermedia como lo es Pereira, en nuestro país Colombia. Agradecemos al gobierno de Polonia por esta convocatoria y por supuesto a todos los organizadores de este evento por esta importante experiencia. Saludos para todos los funcionarios, tanto públicos y privados de diferentes niveles del gobierno, del gobierno central, del gobierno subregional. Agradezco a la Embajada de los Países Bajos también por esta invitación, a BNG Internacional por transmitir esta convocatoria y crear conciencia en nuestro equipo de trabajo para participar de este importante foro mundial. Y si bien es cierto, como lo decía alguno de mis antecesores, debemos hablar del cumplimiento de los Objetivos de Desarrollo Sostenible a propósito de los escasos ocho años que nos faltan para llegar a la meta, eh, hay muchos temas que tratar esta semana acá y yo me atrevería a decir que estos días no van a ser suficientes para tratar todos los temas con tanta, con tanta profundidad como se necesitan. Debemos hablar, como ya lo decían mis antecesores, de vivienda digna, del acceso al agua potable, de la soberanía alimentaria, de la migración, de la transición energética de la consolidación del transporte público, de la consolidación de los servicios públicos. Y yo me atrevería a asegurar que debemos introducirles algunos temas adicionales. Eh, no deberíamos irnos esta semana de trabajo y de discusión, tanto académica como técnica, sin tocar el tema de cómo vamos con la lucha contra las drogas. ¿Es la legalización el camino a sobreponernos a este fenómeno? ¿O es la prohibición el camino para sobreponernos al mismo? Yo diría que si bien es cierto, hay muchos temas por tratar, este foro urbano mundial debe centrarse en este, que es uno de los principales aspectos de nuestra sociedad, en donde tenemos muchos puntos de vista encontrados y parece ser que no tenemos un punto de vista conciliatorio a nivel planetario. Lo que sí es cierto en cuanto a la ciudad que represento, es que se está constituyendo en uno de los principales problemas de nuestra generación, es uno de los principales problemas que está dejando muchos muertos en nuestro territorio. Lamentablemente muchas familias, muchas madres tienen que enterrar a muchos de sus hijos, pero también estas madres tienen que visitarlos también en las cárceles y con ello poco a poco vamos destruyendo las próximas generaciones. Y quiero enlazar esa preocupación que tengo para compartir con ustedes con otra adicional que también tiene que ver con ello. Yo creo que la gran mayoría de los ciudadanos nos preocupamos mucho por las próximas elecciones y por supuesto los representantes de los gobiernos también lo hacemos así. Y lo que tenemos que estar es más que preocupados por las próximas elecciones, es por las próximas generaciones y el consumo de drogas es uno de los que tenemos que trabajar para superar los problemas de la calidad de vida de todos los habitantes del planeta, indistintamente de que las ciudades sean grandes, medianas o pequeñas. Y hay otro tema adicional que introducir y es la inflación. En medio de la pandemia lo que vimos fue la racionalización o la perturbación de nuestra vida social y productiva, de nuestra vida económica, laboral familiar, pero nunca nos imaginamos, diría yo hace un año para acá, que uno de los principales problemas de las ciudades, no solamente las colombianas, sino de todas las ciudades planetarias, iba a ser la inflación. 
qué bueno sacar una posición conjunta en este foro urbano mundial frente a qué podemos hacer las ciudades, qué podemos hacer los territorios frente a esta dificultad que lamentablemente está convirtiendo a más pobres en mucho más pobres y con ello está dificultando, haciendo más difícil, entre otras cosas, el acceso a las canastas familiar de miles de ciudadanos que no tienen una, fuente, una buena fuente de ingresos, una buena fuente de empleo y con ello la incapacidad para sostener a nuestras familias. Yo quiero, para finalizar, nuevamente agradecerle a todos los organizadores. Me complace mucho acompañarnos el día de hoy. Aquí venimos con la disposición a aprender y, por supuesto, con la disposición a aportar desde una ciudad intermedia colombiana algunas alternativas a todas estas preocupaciones. Muchísimas gracias. Muchísimas gracias, eh, señor alcalde, también por traer a, a colación ese, el, los intereses de las futuras generaciones, ¿no? que, que son de gran importancia, eh, creo que, que para, para ir haciendo políticas verdaderamente sostenibles, no solamente las necesidades de las generaciones actuales, sino los intereses de las generaciones futuras. Y también por traer, bueno, el, el tema de, de, de la droga, pero también el tema de, de salud y, y, y la capacidad que tendríamos los gobiernos locales y regionales de influenciar eh, cómo vivir más tiempo con mejor calidad de vida, con una mejor salud. Creo que esto forma parte de las discusiones que tenemos que, que tener aquí durante, durante esta semana. Le agradezco mucho, alcalde. We are going to a different continent now. Uh, we are going to, uh, to uh, South Korea, the Yeon Metropolitan City. We've got Ambassador Hoon Jong Jong with us. I, I thank you, Ambassador, for, uh, for joining us. Um, the Yeon is going to be the host of the World Summit of United Cities and Local Governments uh, in October, the place where we hope to adopt our pact um, for the future, but beyond that, which is very important for us, of course, for UCLG, um, Daejeon is a very interesting city that has invested a lot in the relationship between science and, and policy making. We are really grateful, Ambassador, that you are with us. The floor is yours. Thank you, Secretary General, and uh, good afternoon, mayors, governors, and uh, colleagues. And um, I take a great pleasure and honor to attend this assembly uh, representing Daejeon City, uh, which is the host of the UCLD Congress uh, uh, 2022. Please allow me to start by referring to the joint statement uh, we submitted last April before the high level, UN high-level meeting. Uh, in the statement, we made it clear that throughout the worst of the pandemic, it has been local and regional government, supported by their associations and uh, networks across the world, who worked tirelessly at the front line. It is indeed the cities and local governments that provide basic services and caring for people, even in the time of emergency. Local leaders and local officials I think have every reason to be proud of their dedication and contribution to their communities. In implementing the new urban agenda, cities and local government are also key players. In his progress report on the new urban agenda, the UN Secretary General recognized that cities and other sub national governments have a key role to play in resolving our global challenges. Nowadays, urban leaders are required to tackle a long list of challenges. To mention only a few, challenges include housing shortage, deliberated urban infrastructure, economic gap, carbon emissions, in addition, at the time when the COVID is coming to an end, cities and local governments are tasked to drive recovery. It is high time we reset 
and renew our policies and activities, including our quest for the new urban agenda. In this endeavor, I'd like to draw your attention to the upcoming UCL World Congress 2022, uh, which will be held in my city, Daejeon, from 10 to 14th October. Under the theme of the United Cities and local government breaking through as one, the Congress is expected to present political will as well as plan of practical action to deliver sustainable and inclusive urban development for all. In support of the fruitful outcome of the UCLG Congress, I'd like to inform you that the UCLG Congress 22, 2022 will be including a new track, uh, which is called the Daejeon Track, as part of the official program. This track will be composed of about a dozen se sessions with a focus on sustainable development, innovation, science, and technology. Although this track builds on the Korean perspective, the participation of uh, mayors and local leaders is critically important. We expect by sharing their views and experiences, the track will draw up better policy options to respond to urban challenges. We'd like to invite you all leader, local leaders and regional leaders to sit together at the Daejeon track and make your voice heard. Uh, before closing, I also like to ask you to stand together in Daejeon to realize sustainable and inclusive future of the humanity, particularly localizing UN SDGs. So Daejeon will continue to make its utmost efforts to receive you with a red carpet treatment. So please be our guest in Daejeon for the World Congress. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. We have no doubt that there will be a red carpet there. And in fact, I'm thinking of the ECLE colleagues who have several offices there in South Korea. Uh, the, uh, the, the membership of both uh, United Cities and local governments and, and ECLE have a great uh, experience uh, working together with our South Korean colleagues. We we'll very much look forward to enjoying the Ijeon and to learning about your uh, practices and, and programs uh, through this special uh, Daejeon track that you just presented. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. I'm going now to the municipality of San Paolo. Ana Cristina Vansla is here, the chief of staff of the municipal secretariat for international affairs. Um, Cristina, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, greetings from Mayor Ricardo Nunes and the secretary Marta Suplicy. It's an honor for, for me to be here representing the city of São Paulo. Greeting all the authorities, the authorities present here, it's great to see decision makers from different regions gathering for social relevant calls, the new urban agenda. All of the actions coordinated by national governments and international organizations are essential to reverse the dual current panorama of social environment crisis that we are going through, they are not enough. It is more than necessary to understand the vital role of cities and the lo local governments and make quick and target decisions. Aware of this, the city of Sao Paulo is committed to the union's sustainable development goals and to the new urban agenda whose principal role is the Municipal Goals Program, which determines our actions from 2021 to 
2024. In this sense, the city of Sao Paulo has a memorandum of understanding with its EU1 habitat, which is the initial milestone for development of projects on the themes of green public space and homeless people. Cooperation with human habitat, based on the memorandum, has an emphasis in the issue of informal settlements and the climate resilience. Sao Paulo seeks to be at the forefront toward an increasingly social fair and environment sustainable, sustainable city, leaving no one behind. Thank you very much and sorry for my English. It's a work in progress. Well, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for uh, this intervention and, and, and for the role that uh, San Paolo has always played in strengthening the municipal yes. movement. We are uh, truly grateful. Allow me to close uh, this, this first uh, segment uh, with uh, the intervention of Alexandra Aspan Fedriani. A principal researcher, Human <laughs> Settlements Research Group, International Institute of Environment and Development. We have had the pleasure uh, to work together in what we call the Pathways Towards Equality, a, a big research uh, project that will culminate in, in an important, in our important flagship report, a triennial a report that will be issued uh, later this, uh, this year. Uh, Alex, your perspective on what you have heard here and how it relates to the work that, that uh, we have been doing and that has been presented to the Global Task Force last uh, February. Welcome. Thank you, Emilia, for the invitation. So as Emilia said, I've been engaging in a series of research initiatives involving academics, civil society groups, local and regional governments. And based on this, I see an emerging consensus that our current trajectory of local and regional development is locking our territories into unsustainable and unequal pathways. The crossroad ahead of us is about how to address the twin challenge of climate change and deepening inequalities. Local and regional governments here today, you are the closest to those situations and experiences. You are at the best place to promote the necessary changes to radically redirect this development trajectory. And I would like to share with you five ideas on how this could be done. First, we need a rights-based approach to the development of local action. This means that local governments can advance pathways by respecting, protecting, and fulfilling human rights obligations and commitments acknowledged by the UN, as well as by leading in the integration of a whole new set of generation of essential rights. Furthermore, local governments need to do more to recognize and support the everyday and the collective practices that are expanding rights on the ground. Second, to localize rights in territories, local and regional governments need to address the spatial dimension of environment and social injustices. Only with a spatial lens, we can address social spatial fragmentation, promote proximity and accessibility, and reinforce urban-rural reciprocity, which is essential to advance the rights and for just ecological transitions. In other words, as we've heard today to here, we need policy and planning instruments that leave no one and no place behind. Third, we need a new subnational governance culture, promoting broad local partnerships and adequately empowered local governments, and making multi-level governance truly effective. This means local government is not only a provider or an enabler, but it has to be seen as a guarantor of rights, ensuring the conditions for a fair, and equitable for, practical, for democratic practices. The fourth emerging agenda is the growing call for an adequate fiscal and investment architecture. It is essential to strengthen and localize finance, propelling alternative economic models that recognize and optimize the value of diverse existing resources. The circular and solidarity economy models are some examples of how we can do this. Finally, Local and regional governments need to engage practically with the notion of time. What does that mean? Well, that means acting to repair historical legacies of exclusion, destruction of biodiversity. This means protecting the rights of future generations by planning for the places of tomorrow, 
through bold and imaginations that consolidate local alliances, long-term vision, and radical incrementalism for the sustainable and fair future. Well, this vision, as Emilia just said before we started, emerged through the development of the UCLG Gold 6 report, produced through a collaboration between local governments, civil society, academ academia, which will be launched in October. At the framework of this World Urban Forum, the Gold 6, 6 cases repository have been made available, and it includes the documentation of almost 70 of existing local experiences of advancing urban and territorial equality. I would invite you to have a look at them. They are on the website, in the UCLG website. I would like to finish by saying that collaborative, participatory, and action-oriented research is here to work with local and regional governments and partners, nurturing alliances that can advocate and lead from the bottom up the pursuit for a more equal and sustainable future. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to share those ideas with you. Thank you very much. Uh, we encourage really everybody to visit uh, uh, the website. You will be seeing it in social media as well. Uh, very interesting work around renaturing, commoning, uh, very, very interesting concepts uh, that, that we are trying to make part and parcel of our future policies, but that are research based on practices of local and regional uh, governments. And um, I'm going to give the floor to the governor of Kisumu uh, before uh, giving, uh, opening the next, uh, the next session that is going to be facilitated by our colleague from ICLE Africa. The governor of Kisumu, you will know him, many of you that have been in, uh, in his beautiful city, hosted uh, AfriCities, the big municipal gathering of Africa. Uh, with thousands of, of delegates um, and demonstrated that uh, intermediary cities uh, have a very important role to play in the urban era and that they're very capable of not only uh, providing well for the citizens that live there but also um, yeah, conquering a space in a global agenda with new ideas. Governor, you are welcome. Thank you for being with us. Thank you very much, Chair. First, for um, very competently sharing this session and guiding us in very important discussions this evening. I'm only going to make one comment, and my comment relates to some very important contributions that Mayor Claudia Lopez of Bogota made today. And that is the issue of um, that the new urban agenda must take into account who the urban citizens are and how they receive services. Mayor Lopez emphasized that women and young people constitute an important aspect of who the citizens of these urban centers are, especially when they do the work that the state or the local authorities should do, that is providing care. The government should provide social security, health insurance, should take care of single mothers, and see to it that the young people get work, but quite often in our urban centers, this issue of providing care in the area of health in the area of single mothers, in the area of young people, even in times of creating leisure time and how leisure time is used, is largely borne by women on their own. And therefore, we as governments, both local and national, have outsourced our responsibilities to women. And in that regard, it is unjust. So I think in looking at the new urban agenda, that issue of focusing on who the citizens are and the extent to which they perform the services that the state should perform, notwithstanding some very grand policy statements that government do make, 
that committing themselves to universal social health and yet not providing it in the areas that matter is important. And even when we establish our health facilities, the extent to which you take care of all those aspects of that health facilities should take care of with regard to women is missing. So I do hope that when we review the achievements of the new urban agenda, as my friend from South Africa has said, we should take into account Mayor Lopez's contribution this afternoon with regard to these two key sectors of urban citizenship, the women and the children. One important contribution that also was made this afternoon is the extent to which countries have taken transport as an important factor in dealing with climate change. And to say that only 35% of our countries have do, done so, again, in the area of transport, young people in my county, for example, who ride motorbikes are the ones who provide the largest service in transport. And women who take, of, take care of young, man, young ones when they are in vehicles take care of young people in vehicles at a risk of being stuffed in very crowded vehicles, and that's a risk for their lives. So those are just two things that I wanted to mention um, in reviewing the new urban agenda with regard to women and children that I think is important. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Madam Chairperson. Thank you very much, Governor. A very important agenda for, uh, for our membership in the Global South is the issue of public transportation, uh, indeed, particularly in intermediary cities. So thank you very much uh, for, for your remarks. And now, uh, Paul, um, I pass it on to you, Paul Corey, Assistant Director of, of ICLE uh, Africa, our sister organization uh, and founding member of the Global Task Force. Uh, this second segment is going to cover local and regional government approaches to peace building and responses to crisis. I think, Paul, we have been covering part of that during these discussions. It's unavoidable because all the topics that we deal with in local governments are intrinsically linked. I wish you all the luck with the facilitation of this roundtable. Thank you very much for joining us, Paul. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, uh, uh, Excellencies, partners, colleagues, friends. Uh, I bring greetings from Gino van Begin, uh, Secretary General of ICLI, Local Governments for Sustainability. Uh, I will take all of the luck that you've offered me, given that about six years ago I was in the top stands at Habitat 3 looking down on the mayoral panel and appreciating uh, very similar conversations. Um, and I think uh, what has struck me in uh, those six years is how far we've come uh, as urbanists, as those interested in the urban and those working in urban spaces. So uh, with uh, all protocols observed, as my colleagues will say, uh, I think we can dive in and, and just to offer a, an opening reflection from, from ICLI, uh, and it's been said by many speakers, uh, we are in a truly unique World Urban Forum moment. Uh, we are in a space in which the urban and local and regional governments have never been so acknowledged in global arenas and global sustain from our perspective, global sustainability agendas as well. So uh, on this side, ICLE wishes to salute you and Habitat on its proposal to host uh, a cities, housing, and climate conference at COP27. We also wish to appreciate the emergence of an urban process as part of the G7, uh, which is uh, demonstrating that our advocacy as the global task force has really been pay uh, paying off. Uh, as part of ICLE's mandate to lead coordination on behalf of the Global Task Force of Local and Regional Governments of the three Rio Conventions, that of Climate, Biodiversity, and Desertification, um, we, uh, and the associated processes of these, we are investing our resources in further thematic areas. And these are the areas of food systems, water and sanitation, oceans and coasts, circular development, and One Health, themes which actually need much more political attention on the global arena. Um, uh, in these processes. Uh, as everyone, I think, has uh, framed in some manner, we are in unprecedented crisis and must actually head now into emergency mode. 
no one can suggest that radical change is not possible anymore. We have seen how quickly the world could change its practices, its behaviors, its infrastructure to protect its citizens from a global pandemic. And these crises have shown the underlying structural issues uh, that underpin our society uh, and that we have to engage with more deeply. So thus far, our session uh, has hoped to seed various ideas into your subconscious uh, to take forward through the rest of the World Urban Forum. Um, and I'm really privileged to introduce our next uh, grouping of speakers uh, to deepen uh, the conversation and add further provocations. Uh, thus far, we've heard themes about creating space for more time for our citizens, time as that very precious resource, uh, the need for intergenerational dialogue, the need to acknowledge uh, the, the horror of drugs uh, from our perspective in Africa, the need to acknowledge undernutrition uh, and the fact that uh, this is robbing people of their potential uh, in our society. So uh, to start us off, uh, I'm very happy to hand the floor to uh, Carola Gunnarsson, Mayor of Sala and the UCLG VP for Europe, to start off the conversation. Thank you very much. Almost all of you has a smart telephone. And if you use this and Google, if you Google livable cities, you will find a whole world of amazing opportunities to create a fantastic life with healthy environments, green parks, lovely fresh food, and lots of social interactions through culture, leisure, and sports. Actually, when you Google livable cities, you can even get examples of where you can buy the best ice cream in the world. And this is quite amazing. And it is, of course, our common goal to build inclusive cities and territories built upon democracy and inclusiveness, where we together can create the future that we have agreed upon in our common agendas. But nowhere, when you Google livable cities and the best cities in the world to live in, it says that you have to struggle for clean water, that you are afraid of letting your children out to play in the park, or that women can't to walk alone because of the risk of being raped, or you spend hours waiting in a shelter for the airstrikes to eventually disappear. And it doesn't say anything about the fight for freedom. A young man in the shelter of Maripol wrote in his diary, you can only wait in the shelter. Some are waiting for spring, some for the morning to come, some for the end of the war, and someone is waiting for the bomb to come and kill everyone. From here in Katowice, it takes approximately four hours with the car to the Ukrainian border. Our neighbors are not just fighting for their own freedom, they are fighting for world peace and democratic societies. In situations of war, it is the most vulnerable members of societies, namely women and children, who are most affected by the consequences of war. During armed conflict, children may be forced to flee their homes, some torn from their families and exposed to exploitation and abuse along the way, especially for girls and women. The threat of gender-based violence is increasing tremendously. We must act. We, the local leaders, are in the forefront of the challenges. And when the mayors of war-torn areas are busy fighting for the people's survival, the rest of us must stand up to speak with their voice. The local leaders must have a seat at the decision-making tables to raise the voice of the people. Through multilateral cooperation, we must build strong societies from the ground up. One of the highlighted strengths of Ukraine's capabi capability 
to resilience is the decentralized system. Without peace, we can't achieve sustainable development. None of the global goals or agendas can be reached in times of war. Peace, democracy, and gender equality are the fundamental cornerstones to build sustainable societies for the future. We're living in worrying times where war, natural disasters, starvation, and pandemics are global crises that we need to handle. But we must learn from the crisis and work together for a sustainable future. From the local and regional level, we both have to condemn war, but also constantly work for peace and peacekeeping. We must contribute with practical help, knowledge, and experiences. In war-torn societies, the road to peace is a difficult journey. Nevertheless, peacekeeping operations have proven to be one of the most effective tools for the United Nations work to help countries achieve a long-lasting peace. We have to build security and peace through people. We can see the power of involving people, and especially with the focus on young people. The youth, they want to create a better future. From the local level, we need to support peacekeeping missions. The aim must be to build secure systems for more horizontal governance structure. Multilateralism and multilevel must be the way forward. Cooperation and coordination are key factors to build peace and democratic systems. We need to address the renewal of the multilateral system to respond to the challenges and opportunities of the urban era. We need to develop a system in which local and regional governments are fully engaged by holding a permanent seat at the decision-making tables, representing their communities and able to build peace and sustainability from the bottom up. We call for a strong international community and an updated United Nations system that reflects the current context, including local and regional governments, in all stages of decision-making processes and, places, and placing at the forefront the value and potential of city diplomacy for a renewed multilateral system. Multilateralism must be based on people and be a form of cooperation in which the local and regional level is represented. Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much, Mayor, for drawing our attention to both the direct and indirect consequences of war and conflict. And I think drawing attention to the importance of decentralization and empowering different spheres of government, uh, as well as different members of our communities to respond. Uh, also, I'm wondering if you brought us any spare ice cream uh, to try. Uh, I'd like to turn now to Noreni Ruslan, Mayor of Klang, for some further inputs. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I have recently been um, moved to a new town. This is my fourth town as mayor, as in Malaysia it is still elected and we don't talk about local democracy in Malaysia yet. Um, and we have been plagued with not only COVID but also a major flooding uh, at the end of last year. So most of the cities in our region uh, now uh, putting into place their plan to overcome the flood so that the people are angry as why this keep happening and uh, we blame it on climate change or blame it on whatever but uh, to the people who have experienced this it is a major inconvenience and, and uh, add on to the problems that they had um, after the COVID uh, which, is, uh, been, which has been said by my colleagues before which is inflation. So now the people of Klang not only face the problem of um, having to deal with the inadequate infrastructure, but also the increasing prices of everyday food 
and um, the, the disruption of supply chains of building materials and also the increasing price of land. So in face of this, I would like to highlight the uh, roles of secondary or intermediate cities within a country to strengthen its position, its role within the um, economy so that we have a competitive advantage. Um, I think better at the position of complementing what is um, needed by the primary cities rather than competing directly with them. Um, my city is a major port in Malaysia, which is situated only 20 uh, kilometers from Kuala Lumpur. Uh, as such, we cannot compete as far as uh, activities that has been flourishing in the primary cities, but can complement as far as um, availability of land, housing, and labors. Because in this era of digital, I think location uh, needs to be re-looked into. We do not want to be placed in a major cities which have high rent, where, can we, where we can still work uh, in a distance, but uh, at a better uh, living environment. So this is what I'm trying to create, a new uh, image, a new vision for a secondary city to complement, to survive in this uh, new inflation uh, era as well as the digital era. It's um, rebranding yourself, uh, re, um, uh, revisioning what you can do to survive within this uh, new era. Secondly, uh, as a coastal city, I would like to emphasize the struggle that we had um, to ensure that the pollution that is land-based from coming into the ocean. So this has to be worked on in a collaborative manner, in an integrated manner. And I have been working um, for this thing uh, for the past 10 years uh, using this integrated coastal management approach and collaborating with other 52 cities uh, that, that are coastal cities in Asia Pacific uh, so that we can learn from each other on how to, to control pollution, on how to enhance what we call as green and blue economy instead of just the land-based economy. So uh, we have been preparing institutional arrangement and also coastal zoning plans in order to help all these coastal cities into strengthening our, ourselves and preventing the pollution of land-based activities from continuing to pollute the life below water. And um, thirdly, being a city of um, a royal city as well as a heritage city, I would like to share with um, other similar cities to look into the possibility of these economies, of the green economy that doesn't require us to open more lands, but instead on uh, strengthening the beautiful fabric, like in my city, uh, where multiracial uh, uh, communities live together. We have the Malays, the Chinese, and Indian that have been living for gener generation together, and that creates a unique cultural diversity that we can um, promote uh, to either outsiders or even, even tourists within the, the, the country to, to, to enjoy our multiculturalism. And um, the heritage area that, 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 is left, uh, that, that has been left by the previous generation. So small steps into this um, other activities that is not based on um, physical and land, uh, land clearing uh, economy, uh, I think will, will, will diversify our source of income for any secondary cities that, that needs to survive uh, in the near future. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. I, I think you've added to the, the framing that we need to rethink how we uh, name cities, you know, the addition to urban regions, the idea of looking at the linkages between large and small cities to complement each other, um, and there uh, focusing very strongly on upstream and downstream impact. Uh, so I appreciate the need to learn throughout this forum uh, about how we interact most directly, uh, not just in the governance uh, and, and conversation uh, spaces. Um, and finally, the power of cultural economy, uh, and I think to, to Adriana's point earlier, uh, using the power of heritage uh, and multiracialism to break open these systems um, of oppression and exclusion. Uh, I'd like to turn now 
uh, to Khadija Ahmadi, the former mayor of Nili. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It's an absolute honor to be here with you in WUF 11 and being a voice, an only voice for Afghanistan city in WUF 11. Well, the world has forgotten Afghanistan. Thank you to Amelia, thank you to your soldier created this opportunity for me and being here. The persist persistence of conflicts and insecurity eventually led to the crisis and these factors will make communities and states more vulnerable as it's happened more in this vulnerable state and community. But for prevention of the crisis in a world, particularly the, the vulnerable state and community, communities, genius efforts are needed to put together to forward the peace process. Peace will never be happened through the weapon and war machineries. It will not be happened through the articulated peace statement either, but it will be possible by the strong community solidarity and multi-layers efforts at the local, national, and international levels. The local government even can play a more significant role for ensuring the security and stability because it's from one hand directly affected by the conflicts, it's responsible to handle the issues of health, service, economic issues, social and political unrest, and environment issues from the other hand. This point, it is, this, this is points emphasizes the crucial role of local, local government in crisis management. Peace is strongly associated with the human rights protection. It's cornerstone of any sustain, sustainable result or oriented effort for peace and stability. Therefore, the central and local government should design their priorities and program with a special focus on human rights aspect. Human rights protection will be better ensured through a public participation establishment at the local and central level from decision making to designing, implementation, monitoring and evaluation of the local government's priority programs and projects. I would like to exemplify, exemplify with my case from the Nili in Afghanistan. Where I was leading the municipality administration last year in 2021, when the city was came under in the intensified attack of the Taliban groups, more than 12,000 IDPs were displaced to provincial center of the Nili. The city has very limited funding sources. Additional, additionally, there is no much international donors per sense due to fragile security situation. The only allocated budget for the city was spent for defending the city. The mayor was playing a commander role for mobilizing the community resource to support the military defense arm of the city at the time. And under the lead law, and under the lead role of the mayor, local community larger, largely participated in defending the city. The local community from the emergency relief groups response to incident, they, they hosted the ITV, IDPs in their houses. They provided food supply to the front line. The other example can be Ukrainian war. Ukrainian refugee crisis and the assistance of the host community with the local government in the European city are good examples. However, the local government should focus on the local peace initiative. They should have a local based crisis response mechanism on a board. We should focus on peace building through good governance with accountability, transparency, and participatory manner. We should be well aware of all responsibility as a local leaders to contribute to crisis prevention, conflict management, and peace building. That is particularly happen when public participation approach is widely practiced and different process. 
local leaders would be successful when they use power and politics to improve service to the people, not use power as a leverage to pressure people. Violators of the human rights cannot be the righteous leaders. The expectation of good governance from them is actually given opportunity to sacrifice the people and community. In, at the end, once again, in Pfizer's at this point, in order to achieve peace, we must reach a common language at all levels that aims to create a peaceful world for all. Let's be a voice for transform our city for better future and for better future for all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mayor, for very directly demonstrating the, the realities of a war that's out of your control and the effects it has on local areas. Um, and for offering some insights into how local areas should respond to this uh, and improve citizen uh, ability to uh, respond to crisis. I think this speaks to a number of themes that uh, have been spoken about where nations make a, a decision and local governments have to mop up. Um, and so equipping ourselves to do so better, I think, is very important. Uh, I'd like to... Uh, hand over to uh, Evgenia Lodbegova, Vice Mayor of Kazan, some reflections. Thank you very much, dear colleagues, dear friends. I'm very happy to be here. It was a long way, but <laughs> in the end I am here. As we said, the local and regional governments are closer to people, and at the time of the crisis, they are the first to feel the consequences. They are first to help people in need, and since 2040, Kazan has accepted thousands of refugees that are forced to leave their homes. They were first located at the hotels, and then, with the support of the local people, they provided with jobs and long-term accommodations. Our city and the other cities from the Eurasia continent to be a part of all international organizations and participate at the global events and discussions. Therefore, for us, it's important to be here today, as I said, and to be at the part of the global dialogue with our colleagues around the world. We are thankful to our world organization, the ACLG, for being the most influential platform for such open dialogue and for, pro for providing an opportunity for all to express their views and opinions without any kind of discriminations. Crises that happen globally or at a different part of the world, they come and go, and during this difficult time, it's important to keep the city-to-city -city dialogue alive and continue the relationship that we were established, decided to go. For instance, today we have about 60 city, sister cities and uh, partners around the world, and the number continues to, to increase. During the pandemic, we tried to be in touch with the most of our sisters and partner cities. Uh, the city of Kazan is known to be one of the most multi-ethnic and multi-religious uh, cities where people, more than 150 nationalities, live together during the old time. And uh, only all together, as a local government, we can rebuild the delicate bridge in a peace. And uh, maybe after that, if you ask Google, what is the peace in the world, they, they said, first of all, it's the peace between the cities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and I think that might be the calling card of uh, our session, peace between cities. And I think we see very often the solidarity between mayors, the solidarity between uh, cities uh, who have to deal with uh, and often show leadership in uh, many unique ways. I'd like to invite uh, Mayor Emmanuel Del Rajo, um, Mayor of Kilimani and the Regional Executive Committee member for ICLE Africa on Resilience. Thank you very much, Paul. 
Uh, I would like, first of all, to thank UCLG Secretariat for the great work that uh, they've been doing. And actually, we are really pleased to be here today. Of course, as mentioned before, we met, it was last month, in Kisumu. So I, I would like to greet uh, Governor of Kisumu, who really welcomed us there to this very important meeting for African cities. I want, first of all, to con congratulate UN Habitat for being this platform for mayors. As we all know, before the Paris Agreement in 1995, the place of mayors in, in the international community was at least very bred. And uh, since then, when the mayor of Paris invited us, invited local mayors to meet in Paris on a side event to the main room, we are not allowed to be in the main room. We didn't have our, our voice there, but we met outside the room, and we made our voice be heard. Since then, things have been changing. And one of the things that I really mention most of the time is that out of more than 12, not to say 14, of the SDGs, they cannot be materialized unless mayors are involved. So mayors are at the crucial point and should play a very important role in the materialization of SDGs. And mayors are always in the forefront of the crisis. I want also to, to congratulate mayors from most countries in Europe for their leading role in receiving the refugees from Ukraine. You played a very important role and you changed the theoretical and the practical debate on migration and on refugees. You did not wait for national government to decide. You were on the forefront and you taught us how to lead without even waiting for permission or even waiting for the allowance of national government. This shows that mayors should have their voice at the international platform. And the UCGL equally have been playing, but, but, but also the covenant of, of mayors have been working and doing their best to put the voices of mayors in the international platform. Congratulations for these three organizations. But not to finish, I wanted also to congratulate Shipra and Maimuna for their leading role in shaping up this debate. Today, mayors have got a voice. Today, mayors are contributing to the dialogue for, to put local government on the international, continental, but also at the sub-regional level. I heard the words of uh, Sao Paulo, I heard the word from Malaysia, but also from Bogota, and I could see a very important trend there. The role of women and the role of youth, not only in governance, but in shaping up the debate on urbanization, but also on the economy. As we all know, cities today have more than 50% of the human living in inhabitants there. But also, cities today are the real engines of growth. We are leading the world economy. And the impact of what is happening in Ukraine on world food commodities, but also on the world economy, shows once again the crucial role and the need for mayors to be heard and to be listened for. My appeal here will be for the UN habitat place in the structure of the UN. I think that it should be put up. We need to come together to make an effort for a change in the UN Charter to place UN habitat at a higher level in the UN so that the voice of mayors and the voice of normal citizens can be heard. Because one of the problems that the UN have is that it's an intergovernmental institution. And as such, they think that by the definition, which is there in the st statutes, is that governments are national governments. So in the framework, I think that there is a lack 
of democracy. And we need to push for a change in the charter so that local government can have a place and can have their voice there. Because I think that we are at closest, we are the closest to citizens and we are more legitimate because we are, the relationship between mayors, local government and the citizens is quite direct. You know, a, a citizen may spend one, two, three to five years without meeting his, his MP or the president, but he cannot su su survive and the impact of decision made by mayors and local government is quite direct. So in that sense, I think that the arguments are there and the reasons are there. So I hope that uh, UN Habitat, UCLG, ICLE, the parliament, uh, global parliament of mayors and the, the covenant of, of, of mayors could come together to push for that debate and for that change in the, in the UN Charter, not only, but also in regional organizations like the African Union, the European Union, the Asian, but also the organization of American states. We need a place in those organizations for local government and for mayors. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor, for the call, and I think the Global Task Force will have to take this on to do even better to get mayors positioned well in decision-making processes. I'd like to invite, uh, shifting thematically, um, uh, Naoko Yamamoto, WHO Assistant Director General, uh, with focus on healthier populations, to share some insights. Thank you, Chair. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's my great pleasure to join here, and I really appreciate our sister UN agency, UN Habitat, and also Assembly to come here to give it some opportunities. WHO promotes a healthy city in decades, but as a public health workers, it's not easy to communicate with other sectors. We all, say, we all believe that the health cannot achieve it by, to, uh, with only the health sector, but it's not easy to do it. And uh, today I hear lots of the different partners and also uh, cities and the local governments, and I convince myself this is an area we can work together more. Let me start off the COVID-19 issues. The COVID-19 pandemic is clearly is our wake-up call for all of us to, on the importance of the urban policy for the global health. And, uh, but we are we sure the world is not prepared well. And also we didn't learn lessons from the SARS or MERS or uh, HIN1 or Ebola crisis, uh, uh, not enough. So clearly we need a more resilient health system. We need to focus on the primary health care. So we talk about a lot about women's and children. Clearly, we really need that one. And not only so the pandemic, but also clearly we heard from the conflict, natural disaster, uh, and so on. So that's issues. But also, not beyond the health system or health care services, is the healthy city or health local government or health urban means uh, the air we breathe or food we eat or uh, environment we work, or water to drink. All issues are very close linked to the health and the health equity and the environment. So having said that, uh, we are now talking about post-COVID-19. We are, are thinking about the more safer, healthier, greener, and the fairer world. To, to, to make this, uh, let me share uh, five issues. First, Global community now discussing a global health architecture, including governance, health systems, and financing. Really need to uh, uh, invite the local government and uh, governance and the cities to discuss this, because this is a place to implement the new architecture. Second issue is climate change. Again, and uh, COP26 in Glasgow, the health issues is the one with the core agenda. Because, uh, for example, like uh, seven million people die every year for, because of air pollution. So the impact of the health is quite important. So energy transformation and clean, uh, clean environment is crucial and we would like to work together more. But not only the um, health sector contributes 5% of the uh, green uh, 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 gas emission, CO2 gas emission, that's why. 50 more cities has already committed zero emission from health sector as well. So we would like to work with the, with the boys. And the third, third is one health approach. 
human health, animal health, environment health, and planet, planetary health, the close link we learn from the COVID-19. So at the local government, we could address these issues. And the fourth, the most important issue, the health equity issues. Uh, COVID-19 clearly uh, hard hit it uh, and uh, disproportionately hard hit it to the poorest poor people and vulnerable people. And I, I am sure that this is a common agenda for the all local government and the cities. So that we would, uh, would like to address these issues. And finally, WHO is now developing the strategic guideline for urban health. And we would like to continue to work together with all of you to, to, uh, to implement these issues at the local level and the city level. And I, today, I'm really happy to find a new partners that's WHO to work together. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I think we're very much looking forward to engaging with the new urban health uh, guidelines. Uh, and I think you've spelled out uh, very clearly that there are underpinning contributions to health, that even if a local government doesn't have the mandate, the direct mandate for health, there are other ways through infrastructure, energy, food systems, water systems, that they can contribute to improved health. Uh, I'd like to invite Kevin Nelson, uh, urban governance lead for USAID, to share uh, some inputs. Thank you very much. Um, I want to thank the UCLG uh, secretary for this opportunity to, to speak. Uh, I, I want to talk about the importance of localization. I, I know we heard about uh, decentralization earlier, but just some themes that I think are important to address, um, especially my organization, the US Agency for International Development. Whether it's called localization, decentraliz decentralizing foreign assistance, community ownership, locally led development or any other term. Stakeholders throughout the assistance ecosystem know that their work is more effective, more resilient, and more equitable when local partners play a leading role in identifying sectors, planning programs, implementing projects, and evaluating progress. As you're, as you're aware, the ground truth, credibility, accountability, and long range, long range time perspectives that, the, that local partners bring to the table are essential for the success in achieving collective objectives under the Sustainable Development Goals. However, we must change the process by which investment from the development community occurs. Donors and partners need to invest in whole of society approaches to address inequities that exist as cities and countries address conflicts and crises and not just funding directly to national governments. So I just want to briefly talk about four lines of effort that will help implement this. First, effective localization requires um, channeling a larger portion of development and humanitarian awards directly to local civil society, business, and other institutions that are supported by and accountable to local governments. So for, for this part, uh, USAID will increase our um, investments of our budget to 50% to, 50 to uh, projects directly at local governments and uh, local civil society organizations. This will help with the um, co-design of projects, setting priorities and driving implementation at that local level. Second, localization means changing the power dynamics among local actors, international, uh, international partners, and donors to ensure that a seat at the local table, as I think we've described earlier, really should be about nothing about us without us. Um, this will also include an increased focus on a variety of factors, um, including marginalized populations, including women, people with disabilities, youth, LGBTQI plus community, indigenous populations, displaced uh, persons, and ethnic and, ethnic and religious minorities. Third, a local systems approach um, tied to each country's unique political, social, cultural, economic, and environmental conditions and targeting that will drive that change. And finally, when donors invest, they can only use their convening authority, partnership, voice, and power of example most effectively when they do so taking the lead from local organizations and local partners. So this, this approach will address key global challenges as we've talked about climate change, uh, conflict resolution, anti-corruption, 
democratic governance, but it, it will set the stage for how we describe and discuss the SDGs to get us to um, the goals that we've set out uh, for 2030. So while, while strengthening the focus on localization is not, not a surprising concept to anyone in this room, the challenge ahead is, needs to change in the way that we invest, the way that we meet, the way that we align our priorities, the way that we co-create, the way that we meaningful, meaningfully build local capacity, and the way that we minimize risks in which long-standing practices that impede our progress can be changed. This conversation and the dialogue through the World Urban Forum can help us address these concerns and evaluate, evaluate localization through the development community. So I look forward to our continued conversation and once again appreciate the, uh, the time to address this audience. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kevin, for, for sharing the insights. Uh, I wish to just appreciate the introspection uh, that's uh, clear here uh, for a development aid organization, uh, and particularly the uh, comment on most effectively um, seeing results by taking the lead from local um, partners, uh, and I think appreciating what capabilities already exist there. Uh, so thanks very much for the inputs. I'd like to invite Flora Maboa Boltman, uh, Selga Deputy President, to add to the conversation. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson of the session. Let me also take this opportunity to thank uh, UCL, UCLG for the opportunity to address the sitting, a very important one, and, and we are very pleased to participate here. Uh, greetings to the mayors that are here and everybody else. Uh, maybe I must join uh, my colleague who said all protocols observed. Um, we are in a very difficult uh, uh, period as global and, and local uh, communities. This includes, uh, and, 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 and it talks of managing uh, communities. This um, uh, is an issue that we need to look, the issue that we need to look at is, uh, one of them is uh, climate change, as my colleague uh, indicated earlier that uh, in our uh, uh, country we had uh, the one that was uh, popularized or maybe uh, shown all over KZN, where we have seen things that uh, we never thought it will befall us. And uh, one must say that uh, also in the Eastern Cape there were incidents uh, or uh, larger issues that uh, happened in terms of um, um, a global warming or climate change, uh, your Northwest, Eastern Cape. <clears throat> and I understand also that in, in Bangladesh, India, and Colombia, the same things happened, which poses a challenge to all of us to say, going back uh, from here, we have to prioritize issues of climate change. The most devastating eff uh, effects are felt at local level or a local government. Local leaders, therefore, has, has got a critical role to play in facilitating peace, as it was indicated here that we're looking at, at such. Because if we do have peace from local uh, and, and there's social cohesion and there's inclusivity, uh, where we will look at every sector and put everyone in and get their ideas, we will really uh, minimize the challenges that uh, uh, we have. We, we as local government looked at the challenges that uh, councillors are having. Uh, uh, they are in the forefront of uh, responding to various issues in, uh, from various uh, uh, forums. And uh, remember, they, somebody spoke about um, uh, um, um, protest earlier, and councillors are in, in uh, you know, they are exposed and very uh, vulnerable, which is something that uh, we have to look at, uh, and their safety is always not uh, 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 assured in terms of uh, the uh, finances that will, or, or insurances that will cover them. So 
uh, uh, they are looking, they are uh, uh, filling the brand at a, a local level. In South Africa, um, um, uh, the policy, uh, policies or pieces of legislation that are governing uh, local government, your Systems Act, your, your Municipal Structures Act, and many others uh, in place, uh, 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 they are in the for forefront of uh, uh, facilitating social cohesion. We have, for example, programs that we lead, a uh, program of going to the people, uh, programs of consulting people, we, we calling them ITPs, as you've indicated uh, earlier here. But uh, I want to mention one that is uh, also assisting and, and put it on the table that uh, some of the countries that are here uh, must look at as well your DDM, District uh, uh, Development uh, Model. At that level, we include all the sectors so when we talk about collaboration, when we talk about IGR uh, structures, we sit uh, together and mobilize resources that will deal with the issues that are affecting us at local. And in doing so, we will make sure that all the sectors are coming together. We look at all the issues, your, 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 your peace in, in, in every municipality, uh, uh, because we believe if every sector, every municipality in the uh, one country to the other. It will really uh, 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 create peace. It is therefore essential for national and, and, and global leaders to provide the necessary support to councillors and their local counterparts in order to implement what is decided upon at all the consultative uh, forums. It will be through local and regional government where we will see change and we will see progress. Key within the role of the councillors is to facilitate dialogue amongst uh, uh, various stakeholders, uh, the groups uh, people spoke uh, about here, your, your civil society also if we include them, your, 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 your leaders, traditional leaders. In, in South Africa we have traditional leaders, your traditional leaders, women sector, uh, 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 all the sectors that are there, we put all of them together and we will be understanding one another and be able to come up with a point of saying we are going to be responsible for our areas, we will make sure that there is peace uh, everywhere where we, 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 we stay. For now, um, uh, I just want to say local government uh, in South Africa has also established uh, uh, various uh, uh, programs that are dealing with uh, uh, issues of services and uh, issues of safety. We, we deal with, as I indicated, IGR uh, structures and we, we come together. There are structures like your CPFs, your what have you, and we really see light in terms of that when we are coming together under one roof and decide as to what is it that we want to see in, in, in our place. Uh, um, uh, we, 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 we also had a, a way of bringing everybody else together except for the other structures. We, we single out your private sector we, we, we meet them separately, your private sector, your, your, your gender groups. Uh, I had here uh, a, a role of women and youth was highlighted uh, with a very high note, which one will want to support. And in some cases, when I was listening to the uh, women issues, talking, uh, 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 looking at the caregiving roles, which is something that we do not actually uh, put a spotlight on. Uh, one wants to support that and say we, we, we have to look at that and so the groups that we have are also uh, including the gender groups. Organized uh, local government uh, established in, in, in assisting uh, a, a way of taking care of women. We establish uh, the Salga Women's Commission where we, we you know, we, we take serious issues that are facing uh, women leaders. And uh, we also take serious issues of time 
and uh, 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 recognition as well, because um, uh, sometimes that, that part uh, lacks. And in Salga, we established that structure that will look at uh, issues and the objectives include strengthening of the role of women in, in, in local government and society. This support includes uh, necessary policy frameworks uh, accompanied by resources, of course. For now, it is uh, still a tall order to receive the necessary funding. And we believe that this uh, 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 sitting here, uh, whatever decisions that we, we, we will be taking, we will be elevating them back home as to be taken care of. The issues of SDGs we look at areas where we can quickly uh, uh, elevate them and implement uh, uh, some of them. Now, uh, 2030, as everybody else... Sorry, can uh, I ask you to wrap in, in 30 seconds? Yeah. Uh, we, we are close there. Uh, uh, so we have to take action. Now, as I, I conclude, I want to say let's all yearn for peace by holding dialogues decisions taken must be monitored so that all sectors in, uh, in, 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 in the countries are held responsible and they account. And one wants to propose that we have a monitoring tool to say this year we spoke about that, how do we then implement and how far did you go? So in the next time when we meet, we just give report. Thank you very much. Thanks, Flora, for sharing the insights of uh, local governments uh, primarily serving a facilitation role uh, and the importance of building those capacities, uh, as well as some of the consequences uh, of engaging with the anger of constituents, uh, which can be understandable in times of crisis, uh, similar to Mayor Klang responding about the flooding. Uh, I'd like to invite Jeannie Birch um, to reflect. Uh, she's Good president. Afternoon. Oh, oh. Sorry, good afternoon, everybody. I'm representing the General Assembly I'm quite sure that most people should know you here. <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, this is a very exciting and inspiring meeting, celebrating the leadership of you mayors. I'm going to talk about three things, because the afternoon is waning on. The first thing is who we are, the second thing is what we do, and the third thing is an ask. Who we are. We are a self-organized, nonprofit group that was formed in 2014 to support UN Habitat. We have 1,100, we represent 1,100 organizations and 17 partner constituent groups from A to W, from academia to women and 15 in between. Go to our website and find out who the rest are because they're your voters. We are proud members of the Global Task Force. And what do we do? We support the global agenda, of course, the new urban agenda, the SDGs, the Sendai Agreement, and we work locally. We work on housing, we work on transportation, we work on public space, we work on resilience, innovation, healthy cities, age-friendly cities, um, and anything that will support these global agendas. Third thing, the ask. We are working now on a project with UCLG to create a town hall on trust in government. What could be more important to you as mayors to have trust in government? We need you to help us formulate the policy paper and be at that town hall in Daejeon, in Korea, in October. We'll be there and we hope you are too. Thank you. Uh, I hope you have all heard your inputs are required. <laughs> Um, I'd like to invite Mercy Conessa, Director of Institute Catala de Sol. So thank you very much and good afternoon, dear authorities, dear colleagues. Thank you very much to UCLG and UN Habitat for giving us the opportunity to participate in this high-level meeting. As a former mayor of San Cugat and former president of Barcelona Provincial Council, I was in Quito. And even though uh, we are now in a new scenario, in my opinion, what we agreed in Quito is still in force. And from Catalan government, and especially from the Institute of Develop Developing Land, uh, we would highlight the importance of multi-level and multilateral governance. In our case, as a urban plan and housing agency, we have a mandatory from the regional government. 
and also from the municipalities, from the measures. We are oriented towards an inclusive, green and digital society, a society of 7 million of inhabitants. And our institute is focused now in three strategic programs. First of all, reaching social balance through affordable housing program. And uh, I will give you some figures. Our stock of public housing is about 18,000 uh, units of, uh, of uh, house, uh, and we know that 15,000 more are need to have a balance and to solve the emergency of housing in our country. However, we cannot develop more land if we want a balanced territory. It means that we should act on the old buildings, recycling buildings and recycling neighborhoods using the concept of circularity. The second and a strategic program that we are working is connecting our territory, trying to keep economic activities in rural areas. Using digital connectivity, improving the facilities and the services in all these areas, we have the aim to reinforce some unbalanced territories with the engagement, companies, talent, and digital agenda. Some figures. Uh, we can explain, for example, more of uh, 100 economic areas have been developed to different uses. Food, chemistry, pharma, automotive, uh, like uh, proximity producers. Our third program is according to European Green Deal. How we can decarbonize our actions, how our buildings should generate energy, not only for their neighbors, also for the neighborhood. We are now participating in Sinitia project promoted by European Union uh, with the aim to uh, um, give affordable energy to the neighbors. The new buildings will be able to share energy to the neighborhood and it's the change from the consumers to the producers and it will allow local energy production with proximity. In conclusion, affordable housing, affordable energy, affordable, affordable connectivity towards an inclusive green and digital society. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, and for framing this uh, around a society, a global society, which I think is something that we're trying to strive towards. I'd like to invite Jonas uh, Sedozan uh, Gambemeto, Mayor of Semi Poggi. Bonsoir à tous. Nous sommes très heureux d'être là où vous nous voyez. Nous venons précisément du Bénin. Et quand vous entendez parler du Bénin aujourd'hui, Vous savez que les réformes sont courantes et ce sont de très fortes réformes. Oui, nous sommes ici, mais, mais disons-nous que c'est nous qui constituons le socle du développement. Il n'y a pas de développement national sans développement local. Je considère, vu mes expériences, que les mères sont considérées comme nos mamans pour nos populations, car ce sont eux qui entendent les premiers cris des populations. Ce sont eux qui sont les premiers secours des populations. Alors là, l'État considéré comme un polygame à plusieurs enfants, ne pourrait s'occuper autant que les mères. Je vous demande de vous ovationner tous, tous les mères qui sont ici, ovationnez-vous. En réalité, nous sommes dans une situation où 
nous devons nous faire entendre. Oui, beaucoup de projets nous ont donné l'envie d'aller de l'avant. Beaucoup de projets financés par des économies extérieures ont permis à nos populations d'amorcer le changement de comportement. Et ce changement de comportement, nous souhaitons que ce changement soit soutenu. Nous souhaitons que ce changement soit soutenu jusqu'au moment où nous puissions amener nos populations à se prendre réellement en charge. Ça veut dire qu'à notre humble avis, il faut substituer rapidement les projets à thème, il faut substituer à ces projets de nouveaux projets plus ambitieux et faire en sorte que l'on internalise la notion du développement au niveau de chacun de nos administrés. Faire en sorte que l'on responsabilise nos populations pour que, à partir des investissements, à partir des sacrifices des autres, que nos populations, elles aussi, puissent se sacrifier demain pour d'autres populations. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much, Mayor, for reflecting on how we need to build upon our work and share the outcomes of projects to build greater ambitious ones. Uh, I'd like to invite Samuel Pine, Mayor of Kumase, uh, to share some reflections from Ghana. Thank you very much. Um, it's also a pleasure being here today to share our experiences with you. Now, you always want to take a line from the song of the legendary pop star, Michael Jackson, who said, we must heal the world, not healing the world for ourselves only, but for now and for the future. And he was talking about sustainability then. And that became imperative from all the literature, all the academic work that we have, that the issues of urbanization, especially outside of the world, is immense. Um, if we can heal the world, making it livable, making it healthier, making it cleaner, I would want to share some experience with you from my Metropolitan Assembly, that is Kumasi in Ghana. Now, to check climate change and the effects of the flooding that we have been, we have instituted a day committed to planting of trees. Last year, we were able to do about 200,000 trees, and this year, we continue with that. And we dedicated the 10th of June every year. Even though it's a national policy, we've also mastered that into. Again, we're looking at sponsoring a, um, a bylaw in the assembly. And if this is gazetted, we want to make it that each residential household, each living apartment should plant at least two trees to green the area. We're doing so with the effect that when these trees are blooming, the effect of, of the carbon and all that on the environment will be something that we're going to check. Then again, in the wake of urbanization, it comes with the production of waste and um, slums, congestion in our cities and all of that. So we're proposing, and with our partners, including the VAG, we're looking at how to talk about high capacity busing systems that's the bus rapid transit system that we use in our, um, the cities to decongest of the many vehicles that ply the city areas during the day and in the night. In doing so, we also want to use it as a means in curtailing the emission of carbon dioxide into the society from the use of lead, both leaded and unleaded gas that we use in our, in our country. Again, we're looking at um, building proper, modernized car parks. We're doing so to decongest the city of those vehicles that are into um, on-street parking, and that will make um, transportation and movement of people very easy and again. Um, our society, even though we have our shopping malls and centers, we also march into marketing, and therefore it is the assembly's um, desire to put up or build several satellite markets 
We do so with the effect of taking the people from the streets so that those who come to work within the city centre and come to produce the waste, which is a burden for the assembly to manage. When they are out the central business district and all of these places, I will look at it that yes, apart from creating employment for people, to have somewhere to work and generate income and improve their livelihoods, it's also going to take them off the street, decongest the place, and take the waste from that. Because when they are um, um, at a particular place, we can then manage the situation and know that this is how we're going to manage the, uh, the, the waste and all that. So um, as a union, I'm so grateful to the UA Habitat and other organizers for this project. At least we gained something from it, something that we are wish that all our compatriot assemblies and, and metropolitan areas would do to help save the world. And that I also want to reiterate the song of Michael Jackson. It is now very, very prominent to heal the world, to save it and make it better for us for now and for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor, and uh, thanks for sharing several projects. Uh, I think the, the first one about the tree planting and how you've required a number of people to take it on themselves speaks to the theme of uh, uh, this uh, forum. And if you visit the uh, UN Habitat stand, they've got a fabulous pullout of transformation at many different levels. Uh, so I think you've spoken to that very well. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, Andre uh, Georgiou, Vice Mayor of Raminsu Valesa Municipality. Hello, good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for uh, the opportunity to speak to the assembly. It's a great honor for my uh, city, for the municipality of Rumniko Vulcha to be part of uh, uh, Urban Forum. Um, I'm new in the administration. I worked before uh, only in the private sector. And I came to the local administration with some new ideas uh, to think big and to cooperate with uh, all the stakeholders, locally, regional, and uh, national, and especially international. Uh, we have to think about the future and uh, to attack the problems, because we heard today different problems from different area. We all have different laws and uh, uh, different aspects of working in the administration. And I want to give you an example at the moment for uh, the problem of cl climate change and how we uh, try to implement projects that will change the future for, uh, for our city. So we retrofitted uh, hundreds of uh, blocks, flats in, uh, in our city with European funds. We are one of the uh, biggest uh, attraction city of European funds in Romania. And also we try to implement new projects on mobility with uh, new buses, electric buses. And uh, talking today about, I heard, decentralization and um, a metropolitan area, even though we don't have a metropolitan area in Romania and we don't have the laws to, to apply, we fought after the, uh, outside the box and made association with all the others uh, uh, cities in our area, and we are we are we could apply for European funds to uh, to buy electric buses and have a public transport, electric and ecological for all the area. So, I heard today <coughs> talking about policies, but from my point of view, the assembly should also talk about uh, practical projects and how. Uh, we can learn from each other, not only about policies, but also exactly about projects and how we can make a great future for all of us together, because together we can be stronger and have better ideas for tomorrow. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing some of the initiatives uh, ongoing uh, and for committing to sharing and learning in this forum. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, Juan Carlos uh, Cadenas Rey, Mayor of Bucamaranga. Muchas gracias, 
Por este espacio quiero decirles que es la primera vez que estamos invitados a este foro mundial y nos sentimos muy complacidos de poder estar acá y aportar. Lo fundamental es ser capaz de construir colectivamente una agenda de futuro y que nos llene de esperanza. Hemos hablado de que tenemos una situación muy particular y es el reto de la migración. Nuestras ciudades urbanas cada día tienen una presión mayor frente a la migración. Y quisiera plantear varios elementos que conforman factores de migración como lo son la globalización, el cambio climático, la violencia y también la tecnología. Son elementos que cada día presionan mucho más que nuestras ciudades se vean enfrentadas a nuevos retos. Y esto es fundamental dejarlo claramente plasmado porque en cada una de estas variables que están llevándonos a nuevos retos, que al final cada reto siempre traerá una oportunidad para nuestras poblaciones. Hay algo que quiero recalcar. He escuchado atentamente a todos mis compañeros, alcaldes, alcaldesas, y considero que debemos poner un elemento fundamental que es el agua. El agua es la vida y el agua tiene que ser un elemento que realmente nos permita alinear la vocación de nuestros territorios, de cuáles son esas verdaderas dinámicas de crecimiento o de decrecimiento en algunos casos. El agua hay que ponerlo como un factor, un elemento finito. Nosotros, que obviamente cuando interiorizamos el cambio climático, todo lo que tiene que ver los retos de, del aire, del manejo de residuos sólidos, el agua sigue siendo un elemento que los ciudadanos no hemos logrado interiorizar la conciencia en su buen uso, en su protección. Yo entiendo que tenemos retos clarísimos en reforestación, retos en el manejo de la economía circular, pero yo sí quiero recalcar y llamar la atención que el agua tiene que ser parte de nuestra agenda permanente en el desarrollo de nuestras ciudades. En Colombia tenemos unos ecosistemas muy frágiles como son los páramos, que son de las pocas reservas de agua dulce que tenemos en el mundo y ahí tenemos que empezar a tener una clara observación y protección de estos ecosistemas, todo lo que tiene que ver nuestras fuentes hídricas, nuestros ríos, cómo orientamos el desarrollo de nuestros territorios, mirando realmente cómo el agua es el factor diferenciador. Hemos hecho esfuerzos en la pandemia en observar claramente el número de contagios que hay permanentemente. La Organización Mundial de la Salud hizo un gran esfuerzo, pero creo que a través de la ONU también debemos poner algo fundamental que es la información. Nosotros tenemos que fortalecer la información como elemento transformador y de transparencia en algo que es real, el manejo de los recursos que son finitos para enfrentar cada una de nuestras necesidades particulares en nuestras ciudades. Insistiría en todo el tema de información, que la ciencia acompañe nuestras decisiones, que la ciencia realmente dé esa confianza que requieren tanto los ciudadanos como los fondos de inversión. En esa manera, de esa forma vamos a ganar gobernanza, legitimidad en ese rol que tenemos los alcaldes frente a cada uno de nuestros ciudadanos. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much for, for naming uh, your priorities for us to, to consider uh, and sharing. I think it's a very contextual need uh, to look at your own water systems and how you can improve access there. Um, our final input uh, today before I hand over is from Peter Kurz, the mayor of Mannenheim. Dear friends and colleagues, thank you for having me at this important a debate and giving me the floor and I want to focus on the decisive question of multi-level governance and refer once again to the new urban agenda and also to the opportunities the G7 process provide. And let me make a more general remark. I think the multiple crisis also provides 
us a window of opportunity to make a real change regarding multi-level uh, multi governance. And as Kevin Nelson uh, mentioned democracy, I want to mention that the White House invited mayors for the White House Summit on Democracy and also for the follow-up. And uh, we uh, drafted a mayoral uh, declaration on democracy and we promote to sign it uh, during the World Urban Forum. Uh, so this is also, I think, a hint uh, that something is uh, changing and that there is a need to involve cities much more uh, than in the past. The new urban agenda presents an inspiring vision for what cities could look like in the future. The text contains visions of equal and inclusive metropolises where poverty has been eradicated and all residents have access to adequate houses. However, inspiring words on paper will not make our city stronger or more resilient. As we look back at the progress made since Quito, it is clear that we will never achieve these lofty goals without real structural change. In April, at the UN's high-level meeting on the new urban agenda, Idi Maimouna Mokhtarif called on all member states to strengthen multi-level governance by engaging local governments in intergovernmental and national planning processes. I agree fully with the idea that multi-level governance is imperative to achieving the goals outlined in the new urban agenda, and most importantly, making cities better and more livable places for the people. And we must go beyond the promises made in the new urban agenda, that we will foster stronger coordination and cooperation among national, subnational, and local governments. This does not go far enough. We need to move toward co-decision. This vision of real multi-level governance is something that the city of Mannheim is actively working to achieve, especially through our work with the Global Parliament of Mayors, which I chair. In May, the Global Parliament of Mayors, together with ECLE and the Association of German Cities, organized an Urban 7 Mayor Summit ahead of the G7 with valuable input from USLG, and I would like to thank USLG for their support of our efforts and engagement throughout the process, and also Barry Rebranovich for joining the summit and giving his input. We are already seeing exciting signs of progress in the recognition. Our declaration has already made an impact. Several G7 ministerial communiques reflect our key messages on subjects from subnational diplomacy and the restruct reconstruction of the cities of Ukraine to working together to achieve climate goals. We were especially delighted by the G7 development ministerial communique, which notes that G7 supports effective multi-level governance, international knowledge sharing, and stronger financial and planning capacities at the local level. But of course, words on paper are not enough. I'm looking forward to attending the G7 urban development ministerial meeting later this year as a representative of the Urban 7, I, and I think this is really a step forward to have a mayor on the table of a G7 meeting, where I will push, push for real multi-level governance and the inclusion of cities and local leaders in policy making from the beginning. We need to be involved from the beginning in the decisions that affect us. We already, Emilia, talked about preparing together the input for this meeting. This moment of stock taking is a powerful reminder of the importance of multi-level governance. As I said, we need to go beyond the coordination and consultation suggested by the new urban agenda and move forward to co toward co-decision. Cities are a decisive level of government. Without multi-level governance, we will not be able to reach the new urban agenda's lofty goals. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor, very much for your call for real structural change. And I think it's a really nice closer to the sentiments that have been shared in this portion uh, of the afternoon. Um, I think there are a lot of ideas for us to digest, a lot of uh, deep and hard conversations to have over the next week. Uh, so from my side, uh, I wish to say thank you uh, very much for uh, offering these inputs uh, and to share um, a sentiment offered in the Rise Africa Festival by Bayo Okomolafe. Uh, it's a Yoruba saying, which is, times are urgent, let us slow down. So 
I wish to invite you to enjoy this festival very much uh, and take the time to engage with each other and the creativity here. Over to you, Emilia. Well, thank you very, very much, Paul, uh, and, and congratulations for a job well done. Uh, many, many speakers, many interesting things to share. Uh, we are starting the closing session, and I would like, uh, I'm going to give the floor to uh, Shipra Narang Shuri, and then I'm going to give the floor to Chris uh, Williams, both colleagues from the UN Habitat, with the difference that Shipra has been with us in the trenches uh, during the process of Habitat 3, and that is not something that you forget easily. Um, but both colleagues with a, with a very large view of the work that we're trying to do uh, with the United Nations and our notion of multi-level governance and multilateralism. So, Shipra, we have heard a lot. Uh, some of it, I think, is part of the legacy that we constructed together as a stakeholders towards Habitat 3. There are new things, though, eh? and so share your thoughts on this. Thank you. Thanks very much, Amelia. Um, it's really a pleasure, and I know I, um, along with Chris, stand between you and drinks, or you and a walkabout in the city of Katowice. So I will, I will be brief. But it's great to be here. Uh, it's great to be with all the partners. And the World Assembly has become such an important tradition, and we can see why. The openness, the ideas, the creativity, the commitment, but most of all, the solidarity. And that continues, and I think that's very important. The other thing why it's, it's, it's very important also to be in this room is the, is the tradition, the, the established tradition now of taking all the stakeholders along. And we heard from so many. We heard from UITP, we heard from GAP, from PSI, and others. And I think that's, uh, as Adriana said, it's not usual, but it's crucial. And I think the fact that you, you do this again and again and institutionalize it is, is very valuable. We're coming from the high-level meeting in New York, which Chris will, will uh, address in, in a minute. But I just want to flag maybe five big things, just five big things that I, that I heard today. First, um, we talk about local and regional governments, but obviously not all local and regional governments are equal. They are not equally resourced. They are not equally empowered. They are not equal in size, in their challenges, in their problems. They are not equally equipped. In some cases, they're not even equally established. So I think the nuance, the difference, and working particularly with those that are being left behind, especially smaller cities, intermediary cities, Narani, you talked about it. Many others talked about it, uh, Manuel. I think it's very important that we focus on the ones that are completely being left out of the equation in, in this process. Second, local governments um, address a wide range of issues. We heard from everything from water and biodiversity to drugs and, and health, and, and they address the most widest spectrum uh, of issues. The new urban agenda talks about several of these issues. We're making progress on some. We are not making progress on others. And I think this is another important point. As we celebrate the review of the New Open Agenda, six years of the New Open Agenda, how far we've come. The fact is, as Daria said, we're not making progress on many issues. Decent work is one of them, and we are fundamentally regressing on other issues. Again, such as privatization, commercialization of public services, uh, and, and we really need to step back, slow down, because the urgency is, is so much. We also need to work harder, and, and I think Adriana said this, to challenge entrenched racial, patriarchal, discriminatory, exclusionary structures. Frankly, we're not making a dent on them right now. It's one step forward, five steps back, we've heard. Every week we have a few steps back in, in, in every possible country. So I think we really need to work harder on the rights agenda and, and moving forward and how to make progress. And perhaps that's something that we need to discuss more in Dijon as well. How do we push harder on the rights agenda, the rights that are being you know, compromised every day in our cities, for our cities, for our citizens? That's, I think we talked about the role of local regional governments, but it's very important to recognize the, the um, significance of strengthening national associations of local governments. 
We have the networks, we have the regional bodies, you know, the salgas of this world, the, the national associations that need support. They're the ones who really are bringing together uh, their local bodies, especially looking after the, the weaker ones, and I think they need, they need our support. Kevin, you talked about localization, which really holds the key, and I think this is absolutely fundamental. It's not about national governments abdicating their role. It's not about national governments being bypassed somehow by us. It is really about a strengthened system, built on a strengthened multi-level governance system, as Mayor Kurtz also just said. So I think this is absolutely fundamental. UN Habitat, with its work on Local 2030, the executive director talked about it in the morning, is really advancing uh, you know, the, a system-wide approach to localization. We're the agency that works at the local level. We amplify the voices of local actors and local governments, but it needs to be much more widespread across the UN system. We know that. And as Manuel said, therefore a call to strengthening UN habitat is very welcome from this and in this forum. My last point uh, before I finish with, a, with, with an invitation is really about the political progress we're making, and we are making some. The G20, under the Italian presidency, we joined forces, UCLG Habitat and OECD, to make sure that SDG localization, intermediary cities, sustainable urbanization, were all embedded in the G20 uh, language and the communique. Last week, in fact, two days ago, the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting, 54 Commonwealth Heads of Government adopted a declaration that included a commitment to sustainable urbanization. And, and, you know, so I think these are very important moments of progress. G7 is our next agenda. I think, as you just mentioned, um, three tracks on women in cities. We heard so much about the feminist municipal movement today, um, sustainable planning and building, and social cohesion, which, which is breaking apart, which we really need. So I think these are important political milestones. We're making progress, but we really need, in some ways, Emilia, to go back to the trenches and see where we're not making a dent, and then re-strategize and re-engage. I want to conclude by inviting you all to the local and regional government's roundtable tomorrow, where we deepen some of the discussions from today. I think, fittingly, the two themes of the roundtable are caring cities and empowered cities. We talked about both these themes today, but we'll have a chance to, to deepen that conversation. The, the services of care that you talked about, the, the fact that cities need, need to be recognized as actors in their own right, and not just implementers and extended arms of, of national entities. We will discuss all of this tomorrow at the local and regional government's roundtable. I don't know if it's in the same room or any other, but I would really like you to join that conversation uh, to, to advance some of these ideas and really get to a uh, um, uh, a strategy, a collective strategy together on driving these forward. Thanks, Amelia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cipra, also for recalling how important it is to acknowledge the progress that we make. Eh? Because if you don't acknowledge it, then you are also missing the opportunity to actually consolidate it. Um, and there is progress that, that is being made. And, and th this is why I have invited Chris, who has been patiently following the discussion, to actually give a, a few of, of that sense of progress that we have made, uh, and that has materialized in, in a very a strong uh, uh, local and regional government segment during the review of the new urban agenda, I would say unprecedented but also a very interesting path towards that uh, review uh, high-level moment uh, with uh, local governments being represented in, in advisory bodies for both the PGA and the Secretary General. Um, but more, what is there to come? And so I will not uh, spoil it for you. Uh, Chris, you tell it. <laughs> As usual, Amelia, you, you anticipated my every thought. Uh, thank you very much, um, distinguished mayors. It's a pleasure to be here, uh, and it's encouraging to uh, have been through this three-hour session to really internalize the level of depth and commitment that this group has uh, articulated, as well as other constituents that have been in my, invited to this meeting who are outside of local government spheres. I have three points. One is uh, the implications of organized action on the part of local and regional governments as an association at the global level, an issue that uh, 
uh, the mayor from Bogota pushed us to think about more. The second are the implications of the high-level meeting for this group and how they may take it forward. And lastly, the horizon. Where do we see things going for uh, local and regional governments in terms of uh, the Secretary General and Member States' vision of our com common agenda. I'll be brief. First, uh, some of you in the room uh, and myself were here, at, were not here, but in Nairobi in 2002 for the first World Urban Forum. And I can tell you then, I can tell you now that the level of organization on the part of local governments was a shadow of what it is today. Local and regional governments have come so far in terms of their organizing. Uh, the Global Task Force on Local and Regional Governments is the product of heavy lifting over many, many years to bring different groups together, those with thematic focus, as well as those who are representative, to have one common umbrella. This has had a profound impact on member states and the UN system, your level of organizing. Your level of organizing has allowed you to push quite hard with the UN system and particularly with the United, the United Nations system as well as with member states. This has led to a number of activities over the last three years uh, that wouldn't have happened without that level of coordinated action. One is the establishment of the Secretary General's Task Force on the Future of Cities uh, and a decision by uh, Maimona Sharif and uh, Volker Turk and others to open up that space to include the Global Task Force on Local and Regional Governments. So rather than have an internal meeting among member states uh, and UN system, it was open to extend to local governments. This led to a very important input to our common agenda, uh, which was a recommendation to establish the Secretary General's Advisory Group on Local and Regional Governments, which the Secretary General included and put forward to member states and led to a consultative process with central governments through the General Assembly and the Office of the President of the General Assembly. This has resulted in the same task force to establish a terms of reference for the advisory group on local and regional governments. It is our hope that in the coming months, the Secretary General will launch the advisory group on local and regional governments. Importantly, it is not confined to local governments and the Secretary General. It is a group that will bring together central governments, local governments, and the UN system to think through how best to advance multi-level governance, exactly the conversation we've been having here today. Another major important role that the uh, uh, Global Task Force on Local and Regional Governments has done is to push uh, the Secretary General, the, the President of the General Assembly, to open up space to create the high-level meeting that we just witnessed on the 28th of April, which not only included over 100 governments, but included multiple mayors with four representing uh, mayors who didn't just were handpicked by the President of the General Assembly. The President of General, General Assembly agreed to a process where the World Assembly would convene just days before the, the high-level meeting, and four mayors would represent the, the World Assembly to speak on behalf not only of the World Assembly, but what the World Assembly represented, which was a wider constituency of local and regional governments. This has never happened before in the United Nations system. So to be able to do that, we would not have, it wouldn't have happened without the Global Task Force on Local and Regional Governments and their ability to organize, coordinate, and agree to these creative terms that the President had set forth. This has led more space for the Secretary General to operate. So he's not establishing the advisory group on local and regional governments as something that the UN Secretariat wants to do, but he knows that he has the support of member states evidenced by the President of the General Assembly opening up the General Assembly to four mayors on behalf of the World Assembly. I'm speaking quite quickly, I'm sorry for the translation, but I'm conscious of time simply to say that congratulations to the Global Task Force, especially the Secretariat and Amelia, your support uh, to bring forward these openings, these creative spaces to make possible the kinds of multi-level governance and intergovernmental processes that are inclusive and uh, complementary in ways that have not happened before. What were the outcomes of the high-level meeting? We were able to work closely with the President of the General Assembly to consolidate 87 declared actions and commitments that member states made in their statements. These fall in the broad categories of housing, a key issue that we've talked about today. Climate, also touched on today, looking closely at economic transformation and financing. Fourth, looking at the question of post-conflict disaster situations, cities in crisis. How can that be a source of inspiration because of the way cities recover? as an inspiration to national governments and regions. And lastly, to look at the question of multi-level governance, as I've been talking about, decentralization touched on many by many today, and the concept of localization. 
translating the SDG system at the local level to achieve results at scale. So these broad directives that have come out are captured in the document that is now circulating in its annex of actions. I encourage this group to look at those uh, areas of action to consider what aspects they would like to prioritize. They align very closely with what the Global Task Force on Local and Regional Governments articulated at the high-level meeting. A lot of consistency, but let's see how that can be taken forward. My last point, the future, as Amelia has encouraged me to look at. The Secretary General and the President of the General Assembly have entered into consultations to establish the summit of the future. This was initially to take place in September of 2023. It's likely that it will be scheduled in September of 2024 at the high level week of the General Assembly. This is an opportunity for member states to consider the recommendations put forth in the common agenda, one or two, three or four, or the whole uh, list of 25 recommendations, uh, and take those into formally adopted language of the General Assembly. This would then put forward opportunities to really take, in my view, the aspiration of inclusive and uh, um, networked multilateralism to the next level. The President of the General Assembly has received a mandate from member states to do this, so we will be working closely with the Global Task Force on local and regional governments, potentially through the uh, uh, Secretary General's uh, advisory group uh, on, on local and regional governments to move this forward. Watch this space. Thank you. Well, I told you it was worth staying until the end because good news came at the end. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Chris, who is the director. I haven't even introduced him because I assume everybody knows uh, Chris is the director of the UN Habitat Office in, uh, in New York. And, and he has been in the new trenches of creating these new spaces uh, for consolidating and structuring our dialogue with the United uh, Nations. I think there are great opportunities uh, that he just has described. Um, above all, I think we need to come with very concrete proposals about content and things that we want to see in that uh, summit for the future. I hope that the work we are doing from UCLG, but also put to the service of the Global Task Force through our Pact for the Future, can be that kind of uh, contribution with the great inputs of our town hall process, civil society, and other uh, stakeholders. So um, with that, I would say see you tomorrow where there is more to come. And thank you, everybody, for having been so patient and being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.